as we've told folk we're coming to T.C. Williams, everybody knows you and where you are. And by the way, Denzel says hello. Um, so we're uh, delighted to be here for the first time. Uh, while we're getting things set up, let me give you a quick uh, backstory to why we're here, what we're doing, particularly for the young people, the students who are here. And I'm so glad there's so many students here. I'm glad they let y'all come out and yeah. check this out. That's nice. I knew we were coming on your campus. I didn't think I would see y'all. I thought y'all would be in class. So I'm, I'm glad you let you out for a few minutes to come check us out. Um, but this is, um, this is called the Poverty Tour 2.0. So last year, um, about a year and a half ago, I guess, Dr. West and I went on the original Poverty Tour, hence this being the Poverty Tour 2.0. We went out uh, to, around the country um, to try to get a better sense of what poverty looked like in a contemporary America. What does poverty look like today? Uh, we both have talked about poverty and related issues for the balance of our respective careers, but we wanted to get a better picture of what poverty looked like given how horrific um, these numbers are with regard to poverty in America. The official poverty numbers came out yesterday. Uh, we'll talk about that later in this program. I won't jump ahead of that. But last year we went to nine states, 18 cities, nine states and 18 cities trying to get a good sense of what poverty in America looked like. Uh, talk to all kinds of Americans of all races, all colors, all creeds, all across the country. Again, in these nine states and 18 cities. Try, oh, th thank you. I'm a black man. I get scared when I hear noise, <laughs> especially behind me. Yeah. Um, but I, we went to nine states, 18 cities, trying to get a good sense of what poverty in America looked like, and we we learned so much. As a result of that, we were given the invitation, uh, offered the invitation um, to write a book, to share our thoughts, our reflections, and our ideas about how to address this issue. The book is called The Rich and the Rest of Us. Very simple and easy read. It's called The Rich and the Rest of Us, A Poverty Manifesto. Uh, went to number seven on the New York Times list, number one, the Washington Post list, and we were pleased that there was such a response to a book about poverty. So we did, then went to another 20 cities or so on the tour for the book. So a second round of 20 cities to talk about poverty again, different cities when the book came out. And then uh, we decided we were gonna go out again uh, once more for the Poverty Tour 2.0 because we knew that once we, for all the work that we have tried to do and there's some other great Americans who've done much more than we could ever do in their lifetimes, we were honored to have some iconic, there are some historic iconic Americans in this room right now you're gonna meet in just a few minutes and I was honored to see them walk in the door a few minutes ago. Um, so there's nothing that I could do in my young lifetime to approach what they have done, what their legacies are with regard to the issue of poverty. But we knew that when the nation's attention got focused on the presidential race after Labor Day, uh, you know that it's that sprint from Labor Day to Election Day that really uh, matters the most and when people are most tuned in to what's happening in this nation. So we knew that we had to go back out on a poverty tour one more time when the nation was really focused on this issue. Once these job numbers came out, once these poverty numbers came out, we could get greater traction, better traction on this conversation. And so here we are now uh, in that sprint from Labor Day to Election Day, going to four battleground states where this election is going to be decided. And for those of you who live and work here in Virginia, uh, you already know that Mr. Obama and Mr. Romney have taken up residency in your state. Uh, we were in Ohio yesterday, so when they're not in Virginia, they're in Ohio and then they're getting to Pennsylvania and Florida as often as they can. So we're going to Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida, and Virginia on this particular uh, trip. And along the way, we're talking to all kinds of Americans, those who are wrestling with poverty, those who survived it, those who um, are behind U.S. policy on the issue, members of Congress. We talked to two or three members of Congress yesterday, some more today. We're talking to advocates, those who've been long distance runners um, on this issue, again, some iconic Americans you'll meet later today. So it's been our honor, our privilege to travel the nation, uh, conducting these town halls. This is being heard on public radio all across the nation, uh, being carried by the Pacifica Radio Network to public radio stations across America, being carried by the Native One uh, Radio Network, that's the um, Native Americans, and their radio network, glad to have them carrying it. And of course, we're being podcast live, the Huffington Post, is our uh, primary media sponsor, so we're viral every day on the Huffington Post and a gazillion other outlets, and that doesn't include all the media that Doc and I are doing. We've done, I think, four or five national shows just this morning, national TV shows, before we ever arrived here. So we've already been 
on TV across the nation. This one, I took my tie off when I came to see you. But um, we've been on TV all morning um, and radio all morning nationally uh, yesterday and today talking about this issue. So now we're here for this town hall meeting and we got a lot of good information over the next three hours. And particularly one last word um, to these young people who, again, I'm so honored to uh, the, the, the principal and the leaders here have allowed some of the young people to sit in on this conversation. Um, this issue has to be terribly important to you, whether you are a young student living in a family that is in poverty uh, or not. This issue is one that I want you to, to pay attention to today, to learn about, because this issue is threatening our very democracy. This issue is threatening the very democracy. We cannot continue to have a country where 1% of the people own and control more wealth than 42% of the people own and control 42% of the wealth. Let me give you another stat for the young people. The top 400 wealthiest Americans, the top 400 individuals, 400 people, have wealth equivalent to the bottom 150 million American citizens. 400, the top 400 equal the bottom 150 million. Now nobody's hating on them for what they got. I don't knock hustle. So I'm not hating on them for what they have. What I'm saying is that we have to live in a country where the, where, the, where the playing field is level, where there's a level of fundamental fairness for all people. And that's what this poverty tour is all about. And um, we're delighted to have uh, my, my, my dear and abiding friend, Dr. West, well, I'll let's say a quick word before we get started. And I'll let him just kind of mention who the house band. You know, I, I've been doing TV and radio for 20 years now. I have never had a house band. I feel like David Letterman and Jay Leno now. I got my own house band. PBS can't afford a house band. Um, so. Uh, Dr. West was nice enough to bring his friends with him who will be our house band today. So let me just uh, shut up for a second, let Dr. West say a brief word, and Jay, you're almost there. We should be ready. So Dr. West, you want to say a brief word to the audience and we'll get started? Well, give Brother Tavis a hand, give him a hand, give him a hand. Indeed. I just want to say I am so blessed to be at Historic T.C. Williams High School. Can we turn, do, does it, do we have to keep it dark? No, let's turn some lights so I can see some eyeballs and things. Yeah. How many students do we actually have here? Clap, clap if you're a student. Oh, yes. That's good. That's good. Now I want the students to clap for your teachers. Clap for your teachers and your administrators. They working hard. They love you. They second. Now clap for your parents. Yes. You take a bullet for your mama too, just like me. No, but that's very important because this tour is a love tour. You see, we all about the love. And when you really love folk, you hate injustice. When you really love folk, you're willing to serve. When you really love folk, you're willing to make some kind of sacrifice. And we want you to love learning. We want you to love wisdom. We want you to love justice. Love your neighbor, too. There's a spiritual and a moral dimension of what we are talking about because you can't talk about poverty unless you talk about morality, unless you talk about spirituality, which means you are concerned about the kind of person you want to be and you're concerned about the kind of society you want to live in. How are we doing, Brother Jay-Z? We're, we, we, we're moving toward uh, just really thinking. So I guess let me I keep talking. Let me say something about Cornell West theory, don't I? This, this brother about, oh, Brother Tim, about eight years ago asked me, he said, is it all right to name a group after you? And I said, you're going to get in a lot of trouble, but you can do it if you like. And they have been putting out albums, Second Rome, The Shape of Hip Hop to Come. They were voted the number one progressive hip hop band in Washington, D.C. And that's a lot of competition. Washington, D.C. has tremendous talent. So you know how blessed I am to, to spend time with the Cornell West there. And they're always kind of to ask me to go into the studio with them so I get a chance to do a little, not hip hop, because I'm old school, but I just engage in a little spoken word, run my mouth. Okay. And uh, it's always a, a blessing and a joy to work with the Cornell West there. They will be with us each and every hour to three hours that we are here. I, I want to salute the principal. Is, she, is the principal actually here? Where is my sister? Are we ready? Where is she? Where is she? Yes, she is. Give our sister a hand. Give our dear sister a hand. She was so kind to us when we came in. So kind. Absolutely. So we're about, we're about to go. We are ready. Everybody All good? Right. All right. We're going to. Roll these, turn these microphones, uh, we'll turn the machine on, and we're about to get you started here. We're, not, we're gonna pass on the billboard now, just jump right in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. 
Alrighty. So we just 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 open the shell. Yeah. Shell. Thank you so much for your patience. All right, here we go. In three, two. I'm Tavis Smiley. I'm Cornell West. And we are at stop two on the Poverty Tour 2.0 at T.C. Williams High School in Alexandria, Virginia. Yeah, in the house, in the house, in the house. We started our tour yesterday um, in Cleveland, Ohio. We are going to four battleground states, Ohio, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Florida. What a time we had in Cleveland yesterday. In Cleveland yesterday, we, the Janitors for Justice had such impact on us. They were doing magnificent work. Then we had co-op workers and all coming together, all colors and all religions and all regions all came to, to Cleveland. They drove in from what, about 50 or 75 miles or so. And I do want to say is today is Brother Tavis Smiley's birthday. I just want to drop that in as a footnote. I won't tell you how old he is, but he's going to be in four different cities on his birthday on a poverty tour. Isn't that a beautiful thing? That, that's called commitment, though, isn't it? We're going to try to slip in a cake if we can. His mother brought some wonderful food yesterday. But we're going to slip in some what well, we're celebrating each and every moment. But I do want to admit, I know that embarrasses you, brother. But uh, I thank, you, thank you. I appreciate uh, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Let me, uh, let me give you a sense of why we're in Alexandria specifically. Mm. Uh, we knew we wanted to go to four battleground states on this tour. Uh, and so we chose, again, Ohio, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Florida for all the obvious reasons. Um, but when we decided to come to Virginia, we had to pick the right city. And there were a lot of considerations for where we needed to be, and we're traveling in a, in, a, in a bus, and there are all kinds of considerations we had to make for how we could actually fit these cities in in a matter of days. And so for a lot of reasons, we chose Alexandria. And then, of course, once we chose Alexandria, we knew we wanted to come. If we we're going to be in Alexandria, why not go to the historic T.C. Williams High School? So here we are. But as I started to look into what's actually happening in Alexandria, I was shocked, um, and I want to read something to you that is um, out of uh, one of your local papers here, uh, specifically the Alexandria Times, a piece that I want to read. And so for those of you who live and work in this area, you already know this, I suspect, but for those around the nation who tend to think of Alexandria as a pretty well-to-do city, and it is, let me give you some context for Alexandria and why it makes sense that on a poverty tour, in fact, we'd be in Alexandria. And then I want to introduce um, a video that the students here uh, at T.C. Williams have produced, about a four-minute video that I want us to, to see that will give, uh, I think, even some greater perspective and context to this conversation. And then we will have, in this segment, a conversation with the superintendent of schools here. So we're going to talk to the superintendent here in just a second. But let me just read uh, just a short a few sentences from the Alexandria Times. Alexandria is not immune to the poverty problem. Uh, though touted as one of the 25 most affluent municipalities nationwide by Forbes as recently as 2010, increasingly more residents struggle to make ends meet. Since 2005, the number of residents receiving food stamps rose from about 8,600 to 13,844, according to statistics compiled by Alexandria's Community and Human Services Department. More than half of the city's nearly 13,000 public school students are eligible for free and reduced price lunches. When you're talking 13,844 people on food stamps, there's a lot of people on food stamps. That's a lot of people, rather, on food stamps, said Suzanne Chris, Acting Health and Human Services Department Director. And that's a number of people that are underemployed uh, that we're working with to try to get ahead. Poverty is a federally, is federally defined as a single person making $11,170 or less annually for a family of four. The designation comes with earning $23,050 uh, $23, or less each year. Alexandria's poverty rate last checked in 2010 was 9.3% less than the state rate of 11.1. So the city of Alexandria doing better than the state rate 
but you hear those numbers about how poverty has grown significantly here in the city of Alexandria. So it makes a great deal of sense that we would find ourselves here in Alexandria today um, so that uh, these poverty numbers that came out from the federal government yesterday, um, there's one major takeaway. We'll talk to Peter Edelman in just a second, one of the real experts on this issue, long distance runners, co-founder with his wife Marion of the Children's Defense Fund. I want to get his take. I know we're anxious to talk to him about these issues and a number of other guests who would introduce to icons, in fact, again in just a moment. But the takeaway from the poverty numbers released by the federal government yesterday is that the gap between those at the top and those at the bottom continues to widen. The gap between those at the top and the bottom in our society continues to widen. And so although Alexandria as a city is doing better than other cities uh, in the state of Virginia, um, poverty is growing too exponentially here in your own city. And so with that, uh, watch this video produced by some students here at T.C. Williams High School. Imagine you are given the choice of where to live and told to settle for nothing except precisely what you want. Wouldn't you choose an idyllic town where the homes are large with big green front yards, where you can park next to a Lexus or in your two-car garage? Perhaps you'd like somewhere with family-owned businesses selling bread for $8.19 a loaf or bagels for $7. Your children can go to the new $100 million public high school and receive a free laptop for use during the academic year. It's almost utopian, right? Alexandria City is a suburb of the nation's capital and every bit the comfortable nesting ground it presents itself as, at least to some. Poverty is an issue in Alexandria because I grew up on, um, on the west side of Alexandria, which is not the worst neighborhood to live in if you compare it to Chitilawa or like Del Rey and places like that. And we're just in a metropolitan area. Everything's gonna be expensive. So some people just move here looking for a job and they don't find one so they have nowhere else to go. 33.6% of the population, or one in three people, are living at or below the poverty line. Of that percentage, one in seven are children. Public housing provides resources for not only the 5.4% of the population who are unemployed, but also those making less than $22,540 a year. Food stamps and welfare are a bustling business in a city where the middle class is an endangered species. The effects of multi-generational poverty are becoming an epidemic as incurable as cancer. Children are finding it more difficult to overcome this genetic poverty. I think a lot of people are in poverty because they were born into poverty. So it's a cycle. So if you were born into poverty and your mother lived from paycheck to paycheck or your father or whoever raised you, you usually don't know a better way of life. Usually you think, okay, this is the only thing that I can do or you're not motivated to do it because you don't have anyone to motivate you. I was raised um, by my father and my mother when I was at a young age, but my father left us when I was about nine years old. So after he left, my mother had to get like two to three jobs. So I barely got to see her. It's very likely that the zip code you were born in is the zip code you will die in. Fearful nights and bad opportunities abound in poor neighborhoods, while street parties and carpools dominate another. The children meet on common ground the schoolroom. Most people are poor due to lack of education. The only way I really had fun was to go to school and like learn stuff and start reading, start collecting books and stuff. I've been teaching here in Alexandria for eight years now and um, I have students who you know, can't even afford to buy new shoes or can't afford to get a binder for their class. Alexandria's Pockets of Poverty, the moniker given to areas such as the West End and the Old Town Projects, are juxtaposed against new apartments, businesses, and community centers. The growth of development in Alexandria has become a controversial issue as the impoverished are being forced to relocate so that something richer can occupy their space. In Alexandria, there, you can really see the inequity. Many of the elderly have been forced to leave. Um, many of uh, the Latinos, African Americans, uh, even others who were working class uh, whites have been had to leave as well. I think that you can see that inequity in the hallways. The economic gap is visible and splits the Old Town neighborhood down the street. 
Alexandria City supports a cosmopolitan group of people where some can pay $7 for a latte and others are wondering when they'll be able to afford a home of their own. The experience that I had with poverty definitely makes me know this is not a way of life. I could not imagine, I'm 37, I couldn't imagine going the rest of my life with the few years that I had the economical hardship. I couldn't imagine living the rest of my life like that. I believe that poverty affects people personally because it doesn't allow them to go out and experience things. The real solution is empowering people to really transform their lives. There's nothing as simple as the good, the bad, or the ugly, just the desolate, the struggling, and the fiscally assertive. Yeah, we salute the students. Job well done. Job well done, students. Job well done. We are so very blessed to have our dear brother who is the superintendent. He is Dr. Morton Sherman. Thank you so very much for being here. Thank you for being here. We're so honored that you selected Alexandria to raise this at a local and a national level. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you. But we'll just jump right in. How would you characterize the relation between poverty and education given your vision here in Alexandria? Well, let me uh, add some numbers to what you read. Sure. We're sure. not at 50%. That's where we were four years ago. We're at close to 60% of all of our children in Alexandria now being in free and reduced lunch. We have uh, some schools who are at over 80, 85% who are at free and reduced lunch in this remarkable city. And so for our teachers, if you look out of the classroom, you could expect three out of every five children in our classrooms to be a student of poverty. You could expect one out of every four of our children to be English language learners, speaking a language other than English at home. And so I want to give a shout out to our teachers, to our staff, who are remarkable for the work they do for our kids. Mm -hmm. And so, Dr. West, I've long been an admirer of yours. I've heard you speak when I was up in New Jersey, and mm -hmm. you first came to Princeton calmly. Uh, I remember how I just slowly you came into that state and didn't make any waves. Uh, but we need mm -hmm. to make waves. We need to make waves on this issue. I think that often in a city such as Alexandria, it's perceived when you go into Old Town, you go down King Street, where you go into Delray, that we are a wealthy community. We are an urban center. We are the face of America. And for our teachers, it makes all the difference in the world to understand who the kids are in their classrooms. I was speaking to three remarkable young women before I came up on stage, and they were telling me how hard it is to be black and how hard it is to be poor even in this high school, this beautiful, wonderful facility. And so the old paradigm, the old ideas about let's just give the knowledge out to kids, let's do what we've done for generations, doesn't work. It's just not a poverty gap, mm -hmm. it's an achievement gap. You know, some of our colleagues in education have written about this is the civil rights of America today. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't mean kids who are poor can't learn, it's just harder for our teachers to work with those kids, to get through to them. And so what I advocate, and I know both of you advocate, is a connected set of services where the community understands that school systems such as ours can make a difference, but we can't do it alone. There's, there's, there's a great deal of data. Uh, Marion right out of, of the Children's Defense Fund um, comes to mind immediately, but there's so much other data, Capital Kids, there are all kind of organizations that have uh, done the research here, uh, Mr. Superintendent, that underscores the fact that part of the learning disorder or disability that kids face when they come into the classroom has to do with the connectivity to poverty, not having food to eat, um, not having the resources at home, parents who are working two or three jobs trying to make ends meet if in fact they can find work. But talk to me about how difficult it is to focus kids on getting a high quality education when teachers are doing their best, but when, they're, when, when what they're up against are so many other societal factors like poverty that they have to deal with when the kid walks in the classroom. I'll give you two or three examples. We have several schools where we do universal breakfast. We feed all the children because we know for many of our kids, um, hunger is a daily event. So it starts the day um, in, in a way which is different from many schools across this country, and it ends the day because a lot of our kids are going home to empty houses, empty refrigerators, and empty closets. And so the issue of clothing, of shelter, of food are all very real for our students. Our principals in our community work really hard to provide all of those uh, for, for our students, all those concerns, to address those. But if you're a teacher in the classroom, um, it, it raises that level of awareness beyond 
I come from a poor family as well, um, but my parents worked uh, many, many jobs and gave us clothes so that we got to school. But if you come to school every day worried about what you're going to wear or what you're going to eat or what you're going home to, are there books at home for literacy, for mathematical understanding? For our teachers, it's a different awareness and a different sense of what they must provide for those kids. And so one size doesn't fit all. We can't teach white more chairman the same way we teach some of the poor kids in our community. So the job of the teacher is compounded and made so much more difficult in terms of that differentiation. And I, I gotta tell you, I gotta thank our mayor, our city council, and especially our school board. In Alexandria, <clears throat> if there's a place in America that it's gonna make it, it's here. We are in the cusp of being great. And I'll give you some examples. This community has stepped up and said, we get it, we understand you need additional resources. We have the lowest class sizes in the state of Virginia. Our counselors have a ratio of 180 students uh, to one counselor. Our math teachers and our English teachers teach four classes instead of five at the middle schools and the high school. And so we believe that the question about teaching is essential and core to our students' success, but we need to give them a fighting chance to succeed. So across America, because I love what you said about the importance of uh, education, across America, this battleground, this fight that's going on about education kind of boils my blood. Because if we don't make it in public education, in all due respect to our colleagues from other schools here today, if we don't make it in public education, what future does our democracy have? And so instead of bashing our teachers, instead of bashing public schools, our community needs to turn and say the solution to poverty is through education. You know, the great uh, John Dewey, the great philosopher of yeah. democracy and philosopher of education said, without high quality public education, you're gonna have a low quality democracy. But what is the relation between, on the one hand, students who are eager to learn, parents who are involved, teachers who care, administrators with vision, and then resources? And here the issue of the local, state, regional and national levels come into play. Because it seems to me you have to have all of those elements together if you're really gonna unleash young people who are committed to public interest, committed to decency, and committed to a sense of dignity. But what role is resources actually? Play? There's, a, there's a fine line for public educators to say we need more versus we need to do better. And, and the class size issue is a good one. Um, I bet you you have classes at Princeton of 40 kids, 50 kids, and some of 10, but you're a great teacher. That makes the difference. We need to pay our teachers well, we need to give them a fighting chance to succeed, but beyond just the core issue of resource, it's the quality of what goes on in the classroom. It's the quality of the relationship, and it's a belief system. <clears throat> in, in our schools, and I think across America, you'll see a focus on whether class size makes a difference. That's a resource, because you need teachers to do it. Mm -hmm. You need curriculum. We have great curriculum here under the guidance of Dr. Brown and Dr. Holmes. We're in good shape with that. But where the ultimate issue, I think, lies for success, combining all the, that you outlined, Dr. West, is the teacher in the classroom. Mm -hmm. that, that wonderful human being, whether it's standing in the front, sitting next to a, teach, uh, a student, or, or calling parents at home, that's what makes the difference in achievement. So all the resources we provide set the stage, um, but they don't act the play, the teacher does. Dr. Sherman, let me offer this as the, uh, as the exit question. The one thing that I think Doc and I um, um, have, been, have found interesting on our poverty tours and the work that we've done is that everybody in America seems to agree, whether you're left or right. If Mr. Obama and Mr. Romney were to walk in here right now, I can tell you one thing they'd agree on. And that is, as you suggested earlier, that there is a direct link, not even indirect, a direct link between poverty and education. If you get a high quality education, if you go on to college and get some degrees, there's a greater chance that in life you will make more money, that you will do well. Um, the economy isn't bearing that out right about now, but that's the general rule. If you don't get a good education, we know what happens to people who find themselves in that particular situation. So it seems that both the left and the right, Obama and Romney, agree that there's a direct link between education and poverty, and yet we don't seem to have the traction that we need on getting the kind of good public policy out of Washington that addresses that link. So if everybody agrees that it's a legitimate issue, why no traction on it? 
<laughs> Thank you for that question. Uh, <laughs> well, let me be as candid uh, as I can be. NCLB was a wonderful um, law in theory and terrible in practice. Uh, it it no, often no, chi no child left behind. No child left behind. It it approached as uh, I kid our, our staff sometimes that the beatings will continue until morale improves, and so it put sanctions before our schools rather than incentives and rewards and models of what should be for education. I think there's a shift going on in Congress and at the conversation at the presidential and national level. And neither candidate called me uh, directly, but if they would, I would turn them to our students to ask that question. I would turn them to our teachers and to our school leaders. I think the policies have to be about supporting and understanding the role of education. You know, where else in the world do you bash what's central to the, fu the future of our country? So the first thing I'd say is speak out on behalf of public education. Policy level two is provide incentives and supports and opportunities for risk, for looking differently at students of color and at poverty uh, as a core issue. Rather than saying, you know, here's a cut point, all of you need to be at that same point. Third is the issue of continual growth. Um, you know, I've grown and learned as a student and as a human being over life, uh, and, and yet we continue to say you all have to be at this point in order to show success. Give our kids a chance to show that they've grown from year to year and that our teachers are working with those kids and growing year to year. A growth model. Virginia's growth model was proposed to the federal government and is no longer part of how we measure kids. It was a rejected bad policy, I think. We need to show learning over time, not just year to year in an arbitrary fashion. And for Fourth, um, as I said before, and it's a constant theme for us in Alexandria, I think we've turned this corner, we need to honor teachers. We need to put them front and center on a pedestal because they're the ones who make the difference, not me. Our teachers make the difference. He, he is Dr. Morton Sherman, the superintendent of Alexandria City Schools. Dr. Sherman, thank you for your work. Thank Good you. to have you in your program. One more time for Dr. Morton Sherman, please. Thank you. What a way to start the conversation, talking about the link between education and poverty in America. Uh, the music interlude that you are about to hear as we go to this break is brought to you by the Cornell West Theory. Don't get them twisted. There is a Cornell West and there is a Cornell West Theory. Uh, you'll hear music from them for this brief interlude while we reset the stage. Uh, this Poverty Tour 2.0, distributed by Pacifica and Native Voice One. <laughs> We're back at T.C. Williams High School in Alexandria, Virginia for stop two on the Poverty Tour 2.0 last year. In case you're just tuning in, last year uh, we traveled across the country, Dr. Weston, yours truly, to nine states, 18 cities, trying to create a portrait of poverty for the nation. And now we are back out in this sprint between Labor Day and Election Day, trying to get uh, the issue of poverty placed higher on the national agenda. And if you saw the job numbers last week or the poverty numbers this week, then you know when you combine those two things that our nation is a nation in crisis. And so we're trying to see if we can't get some traction about this issue of poverty in the presidential race and beyond at this critical point in our nation's history. I'm pleased now um, to, uh, to welcome three uh, new guests uh, to um, the table for a conversation that we want to do in two parts. Uh, both uh, parts of the conversation, I think about 20 minutes each. So we'll do a 20-minute conversation, take a little break, and, then, and uh, do a second part of this. So we get 
good 40 minutes, which is what I love about public radio. We get a good 40 minutes to have a conversation uh, with uh, persons who deserve much more time than that, but I know it's going to be a rich conversation. Uh, let me introduce uh, first, since he's seated on the far end, a long distance runner on this issue. A long distance runner. He has a new book out called So Rich, So Poor. We highly recommend it. So Rich, So Poor. He and his wife are the co founders of the Children's Defense Fund, the organization in the nation that has done more, has, and continues to do more on behalf of children than any That's other right. organization ever created in this country. Uh, we are honored to have with us today Peter Edelman. Please welcome Peter Edelman. <laughs> Next to Peter Edelman on stage here is an old friend of our, I don't mean to call you old, I mean a friend we've known for a very long time. Uh, her name is Dolores Huerta. Um, she is the co-founder uh, of the United Farm Workers. Anybody ever heard of Cesar Chavez? Yeah. 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 She and Cesar Chavez made this movement work, made it what it is. She is an icon. She is an American hero. Please welcome Dolores Huerta to this stage. And she is the chairman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. Please welcome your chairman, Sharon Bolivar. Peter, um, if I can, let me just uh, want to watch my time here. Let me j let me start with you and just ask um, how it feels to have been with your friend Robert Kennedy all those years ago to see um, what you and he saw as you traveled the country with regard to poverty then to fast forward all these decades later and to see what we're dealing with now as a long distance runner on this issue. How do you process that? Well, first, uh, Tavis uh, and Cornell, both of you, uh, I want to thank you, and I know that's on behalf of a lot of people, uh, for what the two of you are doing right now. Uh, because uh, it is, we, we remember Robert Kennedy actually going out to see people who were struggling and to listen to them to understand uh, by being present. Uh, and that's what you're doing. And I think that's tremendously important. We desperately need uh, a national discussion, as well as people at the local level who are active in building a movement. So uh, I think if Robert Kennedy were here, he'd be appalled. Uh, and that's, that's not to say uh, that we haven't made progress. It's very important to understand that we, we haven't stayed in the same place in the things that we've done. Just talking about hunger, uh, I had the, uh, I went with him to Mississippi uh, in 1967. Uh, we saw children who were near starvation uh, in, in the United States of America, Ch children who had bloated bellies, uh, who uh, had sores on their arms and legs that wouldn't heal. Uh, he said to me as we walked from one house to another that he, this was worse than anything he had seen in a third world country. Uh, he went home and told his children in a house where everyone was expected to do public service uh, and it wasn't even talked about. And he said to his children over the dinner table, you have to do something. You have to do something. Uh, and so what's happened is uh, in that regard, we now have food stamps as a national program. We've done something uh, about extreme hunger uh, in America. Uh, and and uh, during this recession, we have uh, 20 million more people on food stamps in this country than we had. We've gone up to over 46 million people. That's making a huge difference in cushioning people from the recession. There are other things that we haven't done so well. Um, so that he, what he would see coming back is he would ask why we still have 46 million people who are poor if we've done all these things. Mm -hmm. The effect of Social Security, earned income tax credit, long list of, uh, of things. And so we would have to have a, a conversation uh, about what's happened. Uh, so many people working not uh, the same as in the 1960s because uh, of globalization, because our whole economy has changed. We have millions and millions of people who are working at low wage jobs and are stuck. Just in the poverty numbers yesterday, uh,
we could say, well, fortunately, poverty didn't get worse yesterday. That's not much of a statement since you have 46 million people. Um, but uh, the notable thing is that people at the top did, were better off That's right. in 2011. And so the poor people stayed the same. The gap is widening. And that's been going on for 40 years, a steady widening uh, of the gap and millions and millions of people who are just stuck. One more, one more number. Um, it's important to understand not only who is poor by the rather inadequate measure that we have, but on up through the sort of lower middle, up to about twice the poverty line, up to about $38,000 for a family of three. That number went up yesterday. So we had 103 million in 2010, we have 106 million in 2011. So the, the, the getting worse is in the middle. Uh, we're having a little bit of a recovery, but why is it that people don't feel that? Because the, the, everybody from the middle on down isn't getting it. And so that's, Robert Kennedy would see uh, the awful poverty. We now have 20 million people who have incomes below half the poverty line below 9,500 for a family of three. We have six million people whose only income is from food stamps, and perhaps the place where Robert Kennedy would be the most appalled mm -hmm. is on that point. Mm -hmm. So in fact, we have an increase in the working near poor and the working poor. Poverty itself remains 15.1 to 15.0. But when we talk about near poor, right on the edge, yes. two checks away from downward yeah. mobility. And so yeah, yes, uh, yeah. absolutely. So uh, the, the bottom uh, is, is uh, awful. Uh, we've got 15 more million, million more people in poverty than we had uh, at the end of President Clinton, at the beginning of George W. Bush. So that's uh, terrible. But. Uh, as you say, Cornell, the, the, the real uh, thing that we don't focus on in our discussion, we don't talk about poverty either, but, right, right, right. except for what you're doing, but the, the near poor, is, is it's so important to get people to understand there's so many millions of people out there who think it's their own fault that they can't do better, and they don't understand that there's a huge flaw in the way our labor market operates. That's right. uh, so the issue of, of jobs with a living wage takes us directly to our dear sister. Dolores, who just was we, we need to be talking said. about two things here. Uh, for, for everybody, what we want uh, at the end of the day is a living wage, is enough that's income right. to live on. That, that's, that's one. And of course, we also need to be talking about a decent safety net at the bottom. Yeah, that's two. That's right. And then we that's get to education right. and all of these other very key things. Those two pillars, as a way. Yeah. But this is Dolores, what would be the relation between that first point about jobs of the living wage and the rich history of the trade union movement that you were so much a part of? Well, well uh, first of all, if, uh, if, if the minimum wage would have kept up, up with the cost of living, our minimum wage should be over $25 an hour. That means the person working out there in the fields, picking our crops, person working in the jack-in-the-box at McDonald's should be making $25 an hour. This is how far uh, we have fallen behind in our country. And you know, when we talk about the food stamps, I just want to mention this also, mm -hmm. with all of this anti-immigrant, uh, you know, hysteria, hate talk, etc., that um, what, in terms of food stamps, over 50% of the people in the Latino community who are eligible for food stamps don't apply. Mm. Because they, it's all of this fear that is out there, and so people are afraid to even apply for food stamps. In California, they, they recently took this out, but they were actually having people do, uh, be fingerprinted before they could get their food stamps. With our new governor, Jerry Brown, that just went out the window. Uh, so these are all of these things that, of course, add to the poverty rate. And, and we know that there's been, um, in addition to the anti-immigrant, anti-teacher, anti-women, you know, there's also been a big anti-union perspective. And when they talk about labor unions being a special interest, that is so wrong. Working people, are the, <laughs> all of the population of the United States are working people. So working people and unions are not special interest groups. 
They are the population of the United States. But we know that all of this anti-union, so that many people now think of unions as bad, not realizing that labor unions are what created the middle class of this country. Mm. You know, and mm. I always tell people, when you think of a, thank you. <clears throat> I always tell people, and I use the farm workers as, as an example, you know, when you have a farm worker over here uh, who may not speak English, is not a citizen, does have a formal education, has no assets, no money, no resources, they need an organization. The employer, the boss over here, he belongs to a ton of organizations, Chamber of Commerce, Manufacturers Association, <laughs> Western Growers, Farm Bureau Federation, and they pay dues to, the, to those unions, right? I mean, to their organization. So we say, who needs an organization more, the worker or the employer? And you know, we forget that labor unions, org so uh, labor unions are an organization of workers that can represent them on the job and in the state capitol or in the Congress, right? They can defend them at both levels. And so we have to remember too, what have labor unions brought to our country? We wouldn't have eight hour day, unemployment insurance, minimum wage, we wouldn't have safety standards, we wouldn't have social security, workers' compensation, if you get, you know, on the job, public education, this is what labor fought mm -hmm. for, and yet we have this attack on labor unions like we have the attack on teachers. Yes. Let me, um, let, let, let me ask you, uh, Lois Huerta, an impolitic question, but I'm curious to get your take on this. Um, and this is not the first time I know you've heard this. Um, there are a lot of poor people today. One of the things that happens when, when, when the numbers of poor grow so exponentially is that people are looking for somebody to blame for their own condition. And that includes poor people themselves. So that you get even people who are struggling trying to make it themselves blaming others who are struggling trying to make it. The question is this, how do you respond to people who say that those people are taking my job, the economy is sour and I can't find a job because those immigrants, those people are taking the jobs, they're taking my job. Um, it's, it, I got my own viewpoint about that, but what, how, how would you respond, how would you teach us to respond to that kind of nonsense when we hear it? Well, we know that that's divisive and it creates hatred, it create, creates division, and that's exactly what the 1% would like us to do, you know, be divided amongst ourselves because that, that way they can control and they can keep their greed and their power, et cetera. And so we have to fight that. But the thing is that we know that there is so much work that needs to be done in our country. Our infrastructure is falling apart, you know? Our population is growing. I mean, there's no reason why we have more than enough work that needs to be done. The problem is how do we put everybody to work? People want to work. There isn't anybody that doesn't want to work, but they're also not going to work in conditions of semi-slavery, right? I mean, there's some dignity to work. You know, manual work is the most important thing. I always like to say, when farm workers, they put the food on our table. They should be respected. People that clean our buildings, you know, they need to be respected because they keep us safe and sanitary. You know, the people that cook our food in restaurants, these are the people that need to be respected and we have to honor them. But you know, the, the idea is that because you do manual labor that you should be kept in, in, a, you know, in poor working conditions, that is so wrong. So we've just gotta, and I know that even in our community where I work, I, I have an organization, I do community organizing, and we find that yeah, people are out there, they're working, they wanna work, the problem is, how do we create those jobs? And I think that's possibly uh, where we are lacking. You know, how do we, and we know that even with all of the money that they gave to the banks, I have friends of mine who have small businesses that they can't even get a loan. They wanna hire more people, but the banks won't give them that loan. So, you know, our economy is kind of stuck and purposely so, I believe. I think all of this has been done to make sure that President Obama does not get reelected. They're holding on to the money. They don't wanna let it out there. You know, Obama, President Obama, he had a, a he had a bill. Uh, he handed that bill to the Congress to create more employment. The Congress wouldn't even pass his bill, and so they want to blame him. He's got the bill out there to create full employment, but they won't even pass the bill. Yeah. We've got to take a, a, a short break in about five minutes, and we're going to continue the second part of this conversation. But in the five minutes I have left before we take this short break and come back, I want to get a few more questions out. And I want to bring in uh, the chairman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, Sharon Bulova. And uh, Madam Chair, I, I want to pick up on the point that Dolores Huerta just makes about the uh, obstructionism or certainly the lack of bipartisanship in Washington on this particular issue. Um, again, one of these things that I think most Americans will agree on 
um, is that our government is not taking the issue of poverty seriously enough. That is true at the federal level. I think many people feel that way about the state level. They feel that way about the, mun the municipal level. Uh, what do you say to persons who suggest to you that this is just not being given the kind of priority it ought to be given by our government, that there is a sort of political indifference to the poor, um, and that oftentimes in cities and states across the country there is a bipartisan consensus on at least one thing, and that is that the poor just don't matter. Well, I can uh, speak for Fairfax County. Here we go. I can speak for Fairfax County. Uh, Fairfax County is a wealthy county, and we have uh, the highest medium household income in the United States. Actually, we're a little bit lower than Loudoun County. And yet, within our boundaries, within our population of 1.1 million people, we have about 60,000 people who are living at the range of poverty. And in fact, we have about 1,500 people who are homeless, and some of those who are living in the woods. Um, Fairfax County is a place where that's not okay. And our Fairfax County Board of Supervisors and our, our school board is committed to making sure uh, that we are ending homelessness as we know it. We actually have adopted that as a, as a goal. Uh, we've created an office in the county, an office uh, to prevent and end homelessness. Uh, and we also are working with our schools to make sure that young people who are in our schools who are living and their families are living at the poverty level, that they make sure that we have a roof over their heads that they have food and that they have a supportive community. Um, so in Fairfax County, we are committed to making sure uh, that we are addressing the issue of poverty. We realize that uh, it does exist, especially uh, it, it exists within a community where people believe it, it must not and uh, are doing something actively to make sure that we're addressing it. What would be the major impediments uh, to alleviating poverty in this county? You know, I, I guess I would say uh, an impediment would be denial. Just not even acknowledging <laughs> that it exactly. exists. Exactly. And, uh, and that, that's, that's just uh, not right. It's also not happening in Fairfax County. Uh, we acknowledge that we do have a, uh, a, a uh, pockets of poverty and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I was appreciated hearing Dr. Sherman's comments because education really is the answer, making sure that we are providing educational opportunities and employment opportunities to all of our residents, uh, wherever they start from. And, uh, and so it's important that we make sure that we're you know, providing the kind of education and providing uh, the kind of supportive systems that, are, that need to be in place in order for young people to receive a good education and then to, re to get good jobs and to be able to live fully in the community. We must take a quick station break. When we come back from the station break, though, I want to ask you about homelessness. I'm glad you mentioned that because it seemed that some years ago, certainly during the Reagan era, the issue of homelessness was at least on the national agenda. When's the last time you heard anybody talk about homelessness in America? It's just not something that we, I don't, I don't know how it fell off the agenda, but we'll talk about it on the other side of this break. You're listening to the Poverty Tour 2.0. We are in Alexandria, Virginia. This program distributed across the country by Pacifica and Native Voice One.
five. We're back live at T.C. Williams High School in Alexandria, Virginia, uh, on the second stop on our four state, four battleground state poverty tour 2.0, taking us to uh, Ohio on yesterday. We were in Cleveland today again. We're in Alexandria tomorrow. We'll be in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and then on Saturday in West Palm Beach, Florida. So four swing states. Uh, as this campaign for the White House really heats up and trying to figure out how it is that we can get poverty on the national agenda. We've been saying uh, for quite a while now that in 2008, three presidential debates between Obama and McCain, Senator Obama, Senator McCain, three presidential debates, the word poor or poverty didn't come up one time. Obama didn't raise it, McCain didn't raise it, the moderators never asked about it. Two of those moderators respectfully are back on the stage this time around, but the condition of suffering in our country right now demands that the issue of poverty be higher on the agenda and get discussed in these debates and beyond. Uh, and so we're, again, pleased to be at T.C. Williams High School here in Virginia uh, to continue this conversation across the nation about poverty. Um, uh, Sharon Bulova is the chairman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, in case you're just tuning in. We're also continuing our conversation with two iconic Americans, and I do not use that phrase lightly. Uh, Peter Edelman, co-founder of the Children's Defense Fund, and Dolores Huerta, co-founder of the United Farm Workers. Madam Chair, before the break, you were talking about what is happening here in Fairfax um, with regard to the issue of, um, in, in, um, in um, Fairfax County, but in Alexandria, with regard to the issue of um, homelessness. Tell me one, uh, if you can, just give me an overview of what the homelessness situation is. Uh, and then I'm, I'm, I'm more interested uh, uh, to talk about as well how the issue fell off the, the political agenda in the first place. Okay, and I'm uh, happy to uh, share a little bit of information. First of all, Fairfax County, large county, larger than seven states in the United States. We have a population of about 1.1 million people, uh, but we also have a population of individuals and families who are homeless. Uh, not a large number, uh, but about 1,500 people live without a home. They live in the woods, they live in cars, they live from sofa to sofa, uh, they live in homeless shelters. Interestingly, of that population, of the adults, about 50% of those individuals are employed. Uh, they're working, and so you've got some folks who will actually come out of the woods and report for a job somewhere, but they don't make enough money in order to uh, keep a roof over their heads. And regarding the minimum wage and, and a living versus a living wage, uh, housing in Fairfax County is expensive. And someone who is making a minimum wage would, could work for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they still couldn't afford a one bedroom apartment in Fairfax County. So housing is an issue. And, uh, That's why I don't live in Fairfax County, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but if I can just say a few words about uh, the, the homeless population. I was elected uh, chairman in a special election in 2009 when Congressman Jerry Connolly won his seat in Congress. Mm -hmm. And a few years before that, I like to run. I'm not a very good runner, but I like to run. And, uh, and so I was running to explore my new surroundings. I had moved into a new home. And uh, as I jogged down Braddock Road and Shirley Gate Road, I found a homeless camp just one mile from my new home. And uh, three individuals were living there. I actually ended up uh, meeting one of the gentlemen uh, who came out, shook hands. Uh, we talked a little bit. He's a veteran, world, or he's a veteran of uh, the Vietnam War. Um, and it brought home to me the fact that this was my neighbor who was living one mile from my home, and, uh, and I needed to care about that. And when I was elected chairman, we created uh, a, an office to prevent and end homelessness. Uh, we have adopted, and actually when, when uh, Congressman Connolly was the chairman of the Board of Supervisors, a goal to end homelessness as we know it uh, within 10 years. And we've worked very, very closely with the nonprofit communities and also with the faith communities in Fairfax County to work in partnership with them and with their congregations and, uh, and uh, volunteers in the community uh, to reach out to our 
population that is homeless, but also our population that is living in poverty. And one of the things that we have been inspired by on the two tours is a degree to which fight back is taking place among our fellow citizens. Fight back, straightening backs up, shattering the denial, shattering the sleepwalking, and having the courage, and we also hope the love and the humility, but the willingness to fight, and organize, and mobilize in the name of democratic ideals. And that means then that there must be forces at work that are reinforcing the denial, reinforcing the sleepwalking. Many of those forces, persons who benefit from the denial. And denial has to do with denial of human suffering, precious human beings who are catching hell, as it were. You see. What would be some of the f examples of fight back? And either one of either brother or two sisters can answer this. Examples of the fight back that you all have witnessed. I mean, right now in Chicago, for example, we've been very much focused on Chicago because this is a historic battle going on. And I, I want our teachers to know that we stand behind them in the face of this kind of real clash of historic significance. You see. Uh, but I mean, but right now in New York City, we got stop and frisk. We got 10,000 whistles being blown this very moment. Why? Because 700,000 of our precious young people are stopped and frisked every year. That's 1,800 every day. Now, how does a young person have a love of learning and eagerness to learn, expand their imagination? By the time they're 18, they've been stopped and frisked by the police 12 times. How are you going to have a community that has bonds of trust when you have, you're under that kind of suspicion all the time? But these are just examples of fight back. But what would be some of the examples that you all? I, I think that it goes back in terms of, of uh, attitudes uh, among so many people uh, centuries. It goes back to the Bible. Uh, we've always had a sense that there are, is some group of people in uh, any society who are undeserving. Elizabethan England, uh, 19th century America with poor houses. So that's where you start, I think, mm -hmm. uh, Cornell, is, is that uh, it was said earlier, uh, I think Dolores said it anyway, that people somehow have a need to think that there's somebody who's worse off than they are that they can look down on. So that's one, one piece. Mm -hmm. uh, th there's uh, a whole kind of sense that I think is fed uh, by people who have an economic interest in, in keeping wages down. Uh, that whoever isn't doing well, it's their own fault, they made bad cho cho uh, choices, they're irresponsible. Right. We hear that over and over again. Uh, and of course, uh, if there are people who struggle and don't have a job at all or go in and out of work, then they must be even more irresponsible. Uh, and so you get in this political campaign this made-up argument from the Romney side that a, uh, an initiative about welfare which was designed by the Obama administration to help people get off welfare and get jobs has turned completely over uh, on its head. Uh, complete invention. Uh, and saying now uh, what President Obama wants is that everybody should just ask for their welfare check and, and, and they'll get it. It's that same set of attitudes. Now the other thing to put on the, on the table, I'd say two things more. Uh, we can't hide from the issues about race mm. in relation to all of Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and Absolutely. And by race, you mean vicious legacies of white supremacy that traumatized, terrorized, and stigmatized people, be they red, brown, yellow. Yes, black, yes. Uh, but even before we get to, to that sort of totality uh, about it, just uh, the obvious, you think about if you talk about poverty to so many people, they immediately think black and to some extent brown. Uh, they, uh, we remember well, Ronald Reagan said there was this woman in the white Cadillac <laughs> who came up to the grocery store and took her food stamps in and bought the best cut of meat. Never said she was African American, but it was an African American woman. Everybody understood that. So people think black, they think welfare. Uh, nobody says, oh, well, this poor person uh, is a 
white working person who's uh, struggling. The fact is there are more people who are white who are poor than there are either black or Latino. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's actually yeah. Yeah. two points here. One is let's understand how much race and also gender fit yes, into this. Absolutely. Who are the low wage workers? They're women. They're, they're single moms who are struggling and who with only one job they can't get a living wager and sometimes even out of poverty. Who are the people who are on food stamps who have no other income? They're disproportionately women and children. Uh, we want to talk about how poverty has changed Robert Kennedy since 19, the late 1960s. What has changed is the children have become the poorest age group in the country. That's true. We've done well by the elderly. Why are children the poorest age group? Because they're parents and it's generally single moms. So it's a gender issue and it's, it's a race issue. All of that is in what's going on. Mm. Dolores, I, I, Dolores Huerta, I keep uh, asking you these impolitic questions, so let, let me ask you another one. And you know something about this. Um, Doc and I found ourselves saying yesterday in Ohio in one of our conversations that sometimes in life you have to fight with your friends. Sometimes you have to fight even with your friends. Peter Edelman, our friend, mentioned uh, Mr. Obama and, and, and Mr. Romney. Um, and Doc and I have said before that we think on this issue um, that Obama is better than Romney on the issue of poverty. And that does not mean that we're going to stop pushing him to do better. Um, he may be better, but he can be a whole lot better uh, on this issue. He has not made the eradication of poverty a priority, although that's what he said when he ran he was going to do. He hasn't done it. He said he's going to push for an increase in the minimum wage when he ran. He hasn't done it. So we can run the list of things that he has done, but there's just as long a list of things that he said he was going to do that he didn't get to, if we're going to be honest. So how do you, in this instance, fight with your friends? How do you push your friends even to do more than they're already doing, particularly and especially on an issue like poverty that some people do not see as a winning political strategy in November? Uh, well, um, since uh, I know Obama was a community organizer and he was very close to people, excuse me, <clears throat> but I, I think we do, do have to uh, reflect on the things that he has done. Of course, uh, the Affordable Health Care sure. Act is going to reduce poverty to people because and we know that the health care bills are so uh, excessive and so expensive. So if that can kick in and, you know, Romney doesn't get elected and get rid of it, I think that that will really alleviate some of the poverty that we have. Uh, the other thing is, of course, uh, of what he recently did, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, about the Latino community and, and also the African American community, right? We know that uh, the incarcerations are horrible. We have more people in prison uh, than any uh, developed country in the world, including India and China, whose populations are billions of people. And we have more people in prison than either India or China. And, and so what does this mean? In, in terms of taxpayer money, it costs a lot more money to keep somebody in prison than it does to send them to an Ivy League school. That's right. So that our tax dollars are going to prisons instead of coming to education, right? Uh, again, uh, we know that our dropout rate in our Latino community, African-American community is about 50%. And uh, we know a lot of that does have to do with racism, that we're not getting a quality education. Many of, of these parents have to work three jobs just to pay the rent. And so we talk about, okay, how does this affect the kid's education when they don't have a parent at home because the parent is working two or three jobs just trying to keep food on the table and trying to pay the rent. This definitely, you know, impacts upon the education those kids get. Now, in our Latino community, in many places, uh, they don't have the uh, Spanish uh, language education for many of these. I know this uh, county here has a lot of people from El Salvador. And many of these children, when they came to the country, they couldn't really speak the English language. And they didn't provide enough bilingual education for them to be able to study. Eventually, they're going to learn how to speak English. That's inevitable. But they get behind in their other classes, uh, you know, their math classes, et cetera, because they are not taught in a, in a language that they can understand. And so this has a huge impact. And when we, we consider that the Latino population is growing so big, I mean, that this is going to have an impact on not only on this county, on this state, but on the whole uh, United States of America, because they are not getting a quality uh, education that they deserve. And the other thing, that especially that impacted Latino children, is when you have this anti-immigrant hostility. So how many parents have lost their jobs when they won't even hire uh, people from El Salvador or from Mexico? And so this, again, impacts on the poverty. Just one quick thing. The deferred action uh, proposal that the uh, president just passed, which allows 
children who do not have documents to be able to go to school and to get a work permit uh, to help them earn money while they're going to college. This has been a great action that the president did. Mm, mm, mm. Yes, absolutely, I know we're running, we're running late. There, there, there's so much to, to get in there because I mean, the numbers who have been deported in the last three years, very high. Very high, the highest ever. And when we look at the prison systems, you don't see the bankers who violated laws going to jail. You don't see the criminal activity on Wall Street going to jail. Yeah. It's Jamal, Letitia, Juan, Juanita, and white Susie and Bill and, and poor, poor white communities in Appalachia. So I think young people now, they're just so tired of these political parties that don't really want to tell the painful truths and so it generates a certain kind of not cynicism but a suspicion because they m know more and more it's the system that seems to be unjust and the challenge is going to be how do you deal with that unjust system and I want to end this with my dear sister because you began with the crucial point about denial what are the ways in which in your leadership here you're trying to shatter this denial and allow persons to wrestle with the truth. The condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. The suffering in Alexander County, the suffering in Chicago, the suffering in New York, the suffering in the Middle East, we won't get into foreign policy, but suffering across the board. What, what are some of the ways in which you're shattering this denial, given that you so rightfully started this, uh, tried it out, this, 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 this motif? Let me first thank you for this call to conscience and uh, for your speaking up and uh, and the poverty tours that you're, you know, that you are hosting. Thank you. Um, as, uh, as elected officials, mm -hmm. as an elected official, it's important for us to hear from the people we are representing. And I, I can tell you that one of the most effective things that has happened in Fairfax County that has put poverty and homelessness uh, on our front burner as far as issues go is has been the involvement of the faith communities um, in Fairfax County we we began many years ago a program a hypothermia program uh, during cold winters where churches synagogues mosques temples uh, hosted people who were homeless out on the streets uh, so that they would be warm and so that we did not have it have people freezing to death during the cold winter months not only did that help people not freeze and keep people safe, but it also raised awareness among people mm. in the congregations and people in those parishes who were volunteering their time, and it became a personal issue to them. And then they turned to Fairfax County government and said, we need to work in partnership with our government to address this. We don't want to just put a Band-Aid on it. We want to get to the root causes of homelessness and poverty. And that was something that meant a lot to our board and to uh, our Fairfax County government. Uh, it became something that uh, we understood that the community cared strongly about. We care strongly about that. And uh, speaking up and, and making sure that we are bringing this information to people is critical, and I thank you for doing that. We thank Sharon Bulliver, the chairman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. Please thank her. Please thank Dolores Huerta, co-founder of United Farm Workers. And please thank Peter Edelman, the co-founder of the Trinity Defense Fund, author of the new book, So Rich, So Poor. You're listening to the Poverty Tour 2.0, distributed by Pacifica and Native Voice One. This power in the name, watch the shooter's aim, infrared hand drum, infrared skull hand drum, skull. infrared hand drum, ghost, under the lens, rap race, mountains marathon, Abraham and Solomon, Turks rate in the Ottomans, so Apollyon, Abaddon, class vagabond, something to depend upon his guard and his shotgun, stand on your kneecaps, sticky the bees, wax the locks the dreads, two seven slash, I'm on bash on that mother shit gas, no brass, I'm all a call blast from the past, all that I ask, tell the truth, whatever the youngest ask, no secret, man. Cloak, illusion, tearing up the tiger, surprise, 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 surpr
High School in Alexandria, Virginia. This is day two of the Poverty Tour 2.0. And uh, in case you're just tuning in, um, again, this is the second of four stops, four battleground states, Ohio, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Florida, as we try to get some traction here on the, on the subject of, um, of poverty in, in, in America. Uh, we have been fortunate, um, or are fortunate on all of our stops on this tour to have a resident house band at each of our stops. Uh, oh, yeah. I've never had a house band before in 20 years of broadcasting. <laughs> we have a house band at each one of our stops and had a wonderful uh, Jeff Moyer and his and that band in Cleveland oh, yesterday yes, we was wonderful. Uh, we're, tomorrow in Philadelphia, we're at, 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 a, at a church. So tomorrow we are at 10th Memorial Baptist Church. Reverend William B. Moore is the pastor of that church where we'll be, where we, uh, we'll be conducting our town hall tomorrow. So tomorrow we're going to hear some good gospel music. Mm. Can't wait for that. Got a gospel house band in, in Philadelphia uh, tomorrow. But the house band today is a group that uh, you are on intimate terms with. And uh, we should talk to them for just a few quick minutes here before we move on with the rest of the show. So uh, would you like to introduce this group, sir? Well, as I said before, this is not just the Cornell West theory, but this is the embodiment of one of the grand prophetic voices of the younger generation who connects to Curtis Mayfield and Nina Simone and John Coltrane and Chuck D and so many other artists who actually are engaged in wrestling with social misery. So they have a moral and political conscious, and yet at the same time, they're willing to be artistically experimental, creative, but grounded in a great tradition. I don't know who wants to speak on behalf of the group, though. Brother Tim, did you want to give us a, a brief sure, characterization of the group, my brother? Yes, sir. Or Rashad, or Yvonne, either one, either one of y'all. 
We'll figure it out. We'll, we may play a little bit of racquetball. Yeah, fantastic. But give us a sense of what, what the Cornell West Theory is all about. The Cornell West Theory is, the best way I can put it is we try to combine political, social, cultural, and spiritual commentary through the lens of hip hop. Fantastic. And you got the second room, you got the shape of hip hop to come, and you're working on a third album now. Uh, and how do you, how would you characterize the uh, terrain of hip hop these days? Brother Rashad. I feel hip hop is, uh, is in a terrible state. Mm. It, uh, it has no ancestral memory right now. And when it first started, that was the, that was the biggest thing, how it used to, it used to sample from spiritual, uh, spirituals, it used to sample from gospel, jazz, with the lyrics over top of it. But now you have just these uh, commodified artists who are looking to get paid. And so they're gonna do whatever it takes to do that. And when they look at groups like us, and, and because we are the poverty tour <laughs> itself, they say, well, I don't wanna go that route. So it's, uh, you know, <laughs> it's money it. defines their, their consciousness and uh, it's really bad right now. I, I take your assessment, uh, Brother Rashad, I take your assessment of hip hop today. Um, let me ask one other question though, quickly. Why do you think that is the case given the condition um, that those who love and listen to hip hop, certainly people of color, black folk in particular, given the conditions of suffering that exist in our communities today, why don't we have in the lyrical content uh, the kind of call to action, the kind of acknowledgement. Um, you know, just a few years ago, there was a group called Public Enemy that, that did a good job of that. And if you want to go back to the day, you know, Bob Dylan and, oh Lord, so many others. Bruce Springsteen, of course, still doing his, his rich work. But, but talk to me particularly about hip hop and whether or not we are, um, are, are, are there groups out there, are there individuals out there that are speaking to that kind of human condition? And if they are not, why not? Uh, there's definitely groups in the underground that are speaking about that always. I think the problem is that there is a lack of a totality in hip hop, whereas in the 90s, you could hear gangster rap, then you could hear your science fiction rap, then you could hear your fantasy rap, then you could hear your political rap. You could go from diggable planets to public enemy to compass most wanted, but now all you have is this, this titillation, no respect for sacred femininity. And I think because they see that selling, they're more like, well, look, I want to be able to survive, and I still want to be an entertainer. And so this is why you have such of a, a lack of voice right now. And the media doesn't want to show uh, these types of voices anymore. Well, we, we don't mind showing them and, and showcasing no, them. The We're delighted to have the Cornell West Theories, our house band today. Please thank them again. And we'll hear more from them later in the program. Thank you, Cornell West Theory. Pleased to be joined now by Miller Willie. <clears throat> Miller Willie is executive director of the National American Indian Housing Council. Please welcome Miller Willie to the program. Let me start by asking um, to you to share with us what it is that, the, that, that you do every day. What, what is sure. the, the focus of the work of the National American uh, Indian Housing Council? Sure, the National American Indian Housing Council is a national Native American, and Native American organization. We are based in Washington, D.C., and we, um, we represent about 270 members. They're tribal housing programs, mm -hmm. but they provide housing services to over 476 tribes across the United States. And we represent their collective interests to Congress and the administration, and um, also provide the largest training and technical assistance program in Indian country, um, helping them to build their capacity to provide affordable housing within their tribal communities. I'm pleased to, to, to say once again, as we've been saying uh, for this entire broadcast, that this Poverty Tour 2.0 was heard around the country on public radio, thanks to Pacifica, the Pacifica Radio Network, and to Native Voice One. So Native Voice One uh, is carrying this program um, um, uh, to Native Americans all across the country and listeners of the Native Voice One Network. Um, when we, that is to say Dr. Weston and, and myself, when we took our Poverty Tour last year, uh, this is the Poverty Tour 2.0, but when we did the 1.0, the first tour, mm. nine states, 18 cities, when I came up with the idea, <clears throat> and shared it with Dr. West and said, here's what I think we ought to do. He said, I would do it, Brother Tavis, um, under one condition. And what was that one condition, Doc? That we 
they start where America started, which is the encounter with our precious indigenous brothers and sisters. And so we're going to start on a reservation. I said, that's the only way we're going to have this talk about poverty. Because our American Indian brothers and sisters, even if they don't have large numbers in the room, we're going to be sensitive to their suffering. We wouldn't have a country if, they didn't, if, we, if the land hadn't been dispossessed, if the people hadn't been violated. World War I began in 1492 for our indigenous brothers and sisters, and it's been going on ever since. So the remembrance is very important. And their humanity is as precious as anybody else's humanity, and it's just so very good to see one of the descendants still struggling, still resisting in your own way, but the, 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 the violence, psychic, social, physical, has been so, so intense for so many years. We need to remember that a lot of time our politicians talk about slavery as the American original sin. That's a lie. The original sin was the treatment of indigenous peoples. The second sin was slavery. But both were legacies of white supremacy. But that's a lie. Don't erase indigenous peoples history and their plight and their struggle as if it's just a matter of black and white and then later brown. That's too truncated. That's the way our politicians oftentimes like to talk because the Indians don't have a lot of votes and a lot of money, but their humanity is just as rich as anybody else's. That was, that's what that's what that No, no, I, I, I raised that because I wanted, you know, in your own words to express, you know, um, your sentiment about why it is that we needed to start there. And of course we did in fact start there at a place called the Lakota Ray in uh, Wisconsin, you, you know this place, obviously. Exactly. So uh, we, we, had, we, we started our tour there last year. I raised all that again to get to this point. We went to, we went to the, the reservation last year, and we started to ask them about the impact of the Great Recession on the reservation, theirs and others. What has been the impact of the Great Recession on life on the reservation? I asked for our PBS uh, crew or the crew that was traveling with us to record this for a week-long special on PBS. So I asked, what's been the impact of the Great Recession on the reservation? And they looked at me and said, what recession? It was clear to Dr. West and myself that the conditions are always so dire on the reservation, they didn't even realize that there was something called a Great Recession. So tell me um, about the challenges of Native Americans. Tell me about the challenges of navigating poverty. Tell me about the challenges of the particular issue of housing on which you work every day to t and on other issues. Just tell me what these challenges are like because we get, again, Doc is right, we get so provincial. We get so caught up in our own world, we never even think about this particular sector of our society. Sure. Well, I just want to first thank you for inviting me here and to be a voice on behalf of Native American people. I know that there are a number of organizations and we appreciate your invitation to be here today. And thank you for your first poverty tour and going out and starting in Indian country. And the people of Indian country are very appreciative for bringing up their issues. As you mentioned earlier today, you talked about the um, statistics that came out yesterday from the census about the poverty rates. And what's interesting about those statistics that were released in the report is that Indian Native Americans weren't even mentioned. When our poverty rates are two times, almost two times that of the rest of the United States. Wow. United not, States not, not, not even mentioned. They didn't even mention. Don't even track it. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was one of the things that, you know, we're a small subset of the United States population. We don't have a critical mask, but the poverty situations in our, in our Indian communities is very real. And third world-like conditions in a lot of the housing conditions in our Native communities. I was born and raised on the Navajo Indian Reservation, and some of the conditions that I saw firsthand as growing up as a, a Native American person, you know, in our, my community, 30% of, uh, of the folks don't have plumbing in their homes. I remember distinctly a lot of my classmates coming to school and they didn't go home, they went home, went home to homes that didn't have electricity, that didn't have running water. They were getting ready in the morning, you know, and just having to go out and they hauled water at once a week so that they could wash up every morning before they went to school. Buses, you know, were busing them, you know, to about 20 to 30 minutes to school. That's the real conditions that I grew up in and those are the conditions that exist in Indian country. But we don't want to forget 
forget about those, those, those conditions because it, it breeds a resilient people and we're a strong people and we don't want to forget that the one thing that ties us as Indian people and the one thing that we never forget is our language and culture. And it's that native language and culture that keeps us unique and keeps the spirituality of who we are. The native language provides our songs and prayers that keep us going as a native people. And when I go out and speak about housing to Congress and the administration, it's important to note that housing is different for a native person and a native family. It's not just a roof over a head. It's the spiritual embodiment of who we are as a people. Our homes are a temple. I remember when my niece was coming of age and she had her coming of age ceremony, her kinalta. It was done in the home. It was done in my parents' home, in our family's home. That's a sacred place for Native people. And for us to not have homes available for Native people in the, in the communities and where we have families that are up to 25 to 30 people inside a trailer, those conditions are unacceptable. And they're unacceptable for the nation's first people. Mm. <clears throat> So then, what, what's your fight like? Um, we talked earlier in this program, you've been here for a while, so you, you heard the earlier conversations. Um, Peter Edelman made the point that most Americans who happen to be poor are white. There are more white people in poverty than there are black or brown. Um, so they have their own sort of fight back. Um, every time these poverty numbers come out or these job numbers come out, my community, Dr. West community, the black community, we're always at the bottom rung of these statistics. Uh, I've, you know, at least we're mentioned though, at least our stuff is tracked, unlike your community. Uh, but we're always trying to engage in our level of fight back. Dolores Huerta was here, the Hispanic community, um, trying to level its, uh, trying to engage its fight back given the vicious uh, discrimination and anti-immigrant fever that's, that's, that's um, uh, moving about the country right now. But what, what makes your fight uniquely different? How, how do you engage your fight? Because if our fight is difficult, I'm just trying to juxtapose what the fight for the issues on behalf of your community must be like on Capitol Hill every day. It's a difficult fight, especially when um, a majority of your funding for um, su sustaining the communities comes from the federal government. Because of the, tr say, uh, the trust and treaty responsibilities that the f federal government made, they made certain contracts and agreements. Vine Deloria, one of the greatest writers and um, thinkers of our time on Indian issues, talked about the relationship between tribes and the federal government as a covenant between the tribes and the federal government. That these um, treaties and treaty obligations and these um, federal uh, laws that uh, high tribes to federal government is a nation-to-nation -nation covenant. And so, you know, when we go to Congress and administration, we have to rem remind them that Indian tribes are mentioned in the Constitution, that there was there was agreements made when we relinquished our land and we ceased over the, the lands to um, the United States, and that they were to provide for education, they were provide to provide for health care, they were to provide for housing. So we come back with that same, um, and those people on the Hill and within the administration, that same argument. But also understanding the need, the greater need that's out there. I mean, you can't go and look at the statistics on the American Indian people and understand that not, there's 90,000 fam families in Indian country that are under housing and homeless and those 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 needs are still existent but every year there's always a fight within Congress of somebody who has this great idea to make cuts in, in housing and because they don't understand the nature in which we provide housing we're always kind of looked at as the the person that gets the cuts so any little cut to tribal housing this year with the sequestration we're looking at 55 million that's gonna devastate Indian housing and um, you know, for these small tribes that get you know two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to provide housing in their communities, that's going to completely devastate their programs. And so you know, it's it's trying to do the broad-based education. We have a lot of allies. We have a lot of allies with um, religious organizations. We have a lot of allies with our national native organizations: the National Congress of American Indians, the National Indian Gaming Association, the National Indian Health Board. We have to be um, strategic on how we go to the hill. We also create allies with other nations, the Turkish Coalition of America, other folks like that that know the conditions that are happening 
happening in our communities and willing to um, bring their cohorts with us. We're pushing, we're pushing up against a break. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the other side of this break, we're going to be joined by a panel to talk about solutions. We, we don't want to travel the country on this tour and talk just about the problem. We want to talk about solutions. So coming up next, uh, some, a wonderful panel to talk about solutions to the poverty problem in America. But with a minute to go, um, tell me, uh, Miller, um, and Doc and I are always fascinated by people who do the work that you do, but how do you sustain your hope? What, what, what makes you hopeful about the work that you do every day, given what you're up against, and how much worse that is when poverty numbers and job numbers like the last couple of days come out? The hope is the entrepreneurial spirit of, of the Native American people. One of the bills that we pushed through Congress was the Helping Expedite and Advance Responsible Tribal Home Ownership, and it's called the Hearth Act. And that bill went through Congress. It was it had resounding support in the House. The first, you know, a lot of bills don't get a lot of support, but it had unanimous support in the House. 400 to zero voted in support of this bill. In the Senate, it passed the Senate unanimously. This bill basically allows for tribes to take over their own leasing on Indian land and take over their own leasing process once they build their own regulations. People don't understand that the leasing on Indian land, Indian land is held in trust by the federal government and for one family to build a house, if I was to go home and build a house on my Indian land, I would have to go for just my Indian, home, just my Indian home lease to, has to be signed by the Secretary of the Interior. And that process can take anywhere from two months to two years just to go through that oh, process. Hold on, hold, hold up. So when I bought my house, I went to my broker. Yeah. <laughs> we, my broker and I looked at houses. I picked out the house I wanted. I went to my bank. I got the money. I bought the house. You have to get the Secretary of the Interior. To sign off. Of the United it. States of America to sign off for you on to build a lease, house. On every surface lease that That's goes sick. on in Indian tribes. On land that used to be yours. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on land, on, exactly. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. But what this bill does, what the bill that we passed through Congress allows for tribes to create their own leasing regulations and then operate their own leasing on their tribal lands. And this is going to change the face for, um, for economic development in Indian country because for the first time, tribes will be able to operate their own leasing without having to go for every single lease back to the federal government. Those are the hopes. Those wow. are the, the wow. wins that we make in you Indian know, country. They're small little wins, point. but they make a difference. I think in the public imagination these days, oftentimes the Mary Indian brothers and sisters are associated with casinos. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I think of casinos, I, can, I think of speculative activity on Wall Street. Mm. They've made it into casino-like activity, making billions and billions and billions of dollars. No contribution whatsoever to public interest in common good, just big money in private pockets. Then poor people are given these casinos. Even some of our mayors now bringing in all these casinos in order to generate low-wage jobs and so forth. What is the impact of these casinos on our indigenous people? You know, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I'll go back to Katrina. Mm -hmm. There was federal response to Katrina in New Orleans. There was a lot of money that came in afterwards and after they try to do, do things to rectify the first problem that they created. But everybody forgot about the tribes in that New Orleans area, the Huma Nation, the Cato, the Cachada. Oh. And what we had to do was nobody was listening to us. The federal response was very little because they were taking care of what was happening in the larger cities and the urban areas. And so tribes, Native American tribes, and a lot of the gaming tribes, they came together and sent out support directly to those tribes affected by the Katrina disaster. We, came, we had to go to our own people, and we, we had our sister nations come in and provide support. And that was kind of the difference. I mean, a lot of people talk about the fact that there's um, um, the gaming uh, in Indian country, but the gaming revenues that come from, from tribes is di directly used back for government services and government support. It's not used for, you know, for things that you, you, other people may think of, but it goes back to social support and social programs for the tribe. Only on public radio would you hear a conversation like this. Please thank Miller Willie, yeah, the executive Miller. director Miller. of the National Miller. American Miller. Indian Miller. Housing Council, for being here for this conversation. You're listening to the Poverty Tour 2.0, brought to you by Pacifica and Native Voice One.
Welcome back to the Poverty Tour 2.0. We are live at T.C. Williams High School in Alexandria, Virginia. This is uh, day two of this Poverty Tour 2.0. Again, if you, in case you're just tuning in, Dr. Cornell West and <laughs> yours truly, Tavis Smiley, traveling to four battleground states. Is that Ralph Nader on the front row? Ralph Nader's here, y'all. Ralph, brother Ralph in the house. We're, we're going to have brother a one-on-one. -on -one. in the house. We're going to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Ralph Nader a little bit later. Uh, iconic American. We've had two already. Peter Edelman was here. Dolores Huerta was here. Ralph Nader's in the house. Some icons here today. I'm going to talk to Ralph a little bit later in this program. But um, we're on day two of this uh, four battleground state poverty tour, uh, bringing uh, this conversation live to the entire nation over public radio. We thank Pacifica and Native Voice One for carrying this and Huffington Post live for being our media sponsor virally. So all across the country, people are hearing and seeing and getting a chance to come um, face to face uh, with this issue. Uh, these job numbers and these poverty numbers released over the last few days, again, underscore just how um, dire the conditions are in this country. And so we want to talk today for a bit now, as we do everywhere we go, about solutions. Dr. West and I this morning, were, we've done four or five national TV hits this morning before we even got here to T.C. Williams. And in one of those um, conversations, I referenced the name of a guy named Jeff Foe, who's the founder and the founder of the Economic Policy Institute with a new book out that I'm just loving. Uh, and I referenced it on C-SPAN this morning on national television. So <laughs> when, you're, when those royalties come in, you know who to send the check to. When the Checks royalties, in the mail. Yeah, send the, yeah I've, I've heard that before. Um, but he has a new book out. It's a powerful text. It's called The Servant Economy. Servant, S-E-R-V-A-N-T. The Servant Economy, where America's elite is sending the middle class. And what he argues in the book is that we're moving in America from a service economy to a servant economy. Please welcome author Jeff Foe. Thank you. We're also pleased to have Tram Wynn, who is the Associate Director for Virginia New Majority. We'll talk about some Virginia politics vis-a-vis -vis poverty. Please welcome Tram to the program. And Dr. Mady Henson is the Deputy Superintendent of Student Support and Institutional Advancement. That's a long title. You must do a lot of work every day. For Alexandria City Schools, please welcome Dr. Henson. Let's jump right in. We got about 20 minutes in this conversation and I want to get into some, some stuff as quickly as we can uh, for starters here. So Jeff, this book um, that I'm, again, working my way through on, late at night on our tour bus as we move around the country, but just give me the, 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 the top line of what you're trying to get across in this book about this servant economy, as you call it. Well, the top line is that uh, the, the country uh, the people who work for a living in America are moving towards a lower and lower income world. You know, nobody knows the future, but if your ship is heading for the rocks and the captains are not changing course, you pretty much know you're going to be going to come up to a disaster. So what the book does is look at the evidence that's around us and says, asks the question, where are we headed over the next 10, 15 years? Now, what I mean, we is I don't mean the abstraction America, but I mean Americans. Where is the average American, where is the average American who has to work for a living in order to survive going? And the evidence is pretty, uh, uh, pretty dramatic. Uh, clearly, we are going towards a lower and lower wage econo economic world. This has actually been going on for the last 30 years. If you look at the numbers, um, since the end of World War II, wages and living standards rose step by step by step every year until the late 1970s, until about 1979. Then real wages flatten out, which means that someone with the same education and age in 2008, before the recession, was making about the same amount of money as that same type person in 1979. The difference has been, it's, there's been an illusion for two reasons. One, family income kept up because more family members went to work. Two, debt, cheap credit. You weren't making enough in your, in your paycheck, but you could get access to a cheap mortgage, to a credit card, so you can go to the mall and spend. 
those two things are over. There's more women in the, in the labor force now than men, and it's going to be a generation, if ever, before that credit bubble comes back. So we've been experiencing this stagnation in wages. Now we are looking at dropping wages. And the thesis of my book is that the American economy, your economy, is now competing in the world on the basis of lower and lower wages. And I want to say something about education. Education is terribly important. But when a politician says, the problem, if you've got a problem with income, go get a college education and that will solve it. Romney says, if you can't afford it, borrow it from your mother. But if you look at the numbers between 2001 and 2008, that is, eight years before the crash, the average starting salary of male college graduates dropped 8% the average starting salary for female college graduates dropped 5%, and it is still dropping. The problem in America is not that we as a whole are not educated enough, but we are not creating the jobs that create a decent level of living so you can raise a family for people who are educated. The education level in this country is rising. So picture it. Picture the labor force like this, or the job market. Let's call it good job disco. And there's 100 spots in the good job disco. And there's 150 people waiting to get in. Now, you can improve your spot along the line by getting more education, by working harder, working two jobs or three jobs. But in the end, if there's not enough room somebody's going to be left out. And that's the structural problem that we face. Let me jump in right quick because, first of all, we're at T.C. Williams High School, uh, made famous, of course, by the movie Remember the Titans, and I'm looking at a, a bunch of young folk. They've been switching in classes. Of, let, me, let me hear the young folk in here. Let me hear the students. The students, yeah. There are a lot of... Uh, uh, the principal has been kind here and the, the teachers have been kind. They're, they're bringing in different classes of students throughout the day. So students are getting a chance to hear and be a part of this conversation. And I was laughing inwardly when, when Jeff went retro and said disco. I said, these folk do not know what disco is, Jeff. You got you to get another metaphor, man, because disco is not relevant to these young people. But on a serious note, in, as in my reading of your book, because I want to I move on here, but in my reading of your book, you make a very clear case. You paint a very uh, clear picture of what's going to happen to the students I'm looking at right now when they get out of here. So they get out of here, they go to college, as you started to suggest a moment ago, they graduate, they come out as 20-somethings and they can't find full-time good paying work. Those 20-somethings eventually become 30-somethings right. and they become 40-somethings. So just take a quick second here and I want you to talk directly to these young people about what their future is as you see it and then what we're going to do about that. Well, first I want to say I'm someone who was born in the welfare ward of Bellevue Hospital in New York City. So I appreciate how you can rise in this country with education or how you could have risen. Mm -hmm. But the days in which I made it from the welfare ward, you know, into this panel are gone for most people now. So, uh, have you ever been to an Apple store? Well, go into an Apple store and there you'll see the future. And it's not in the computers. It's in smart, college-educated people working as retail clerks to sell Chinese goods. Wow. That's what the Apple store represents for your future. So you, you've got two jobs. One is get as much education as you can. And I think that everybody, everybody here agrees with that. But the second, you've got to be an active citizen. Mm -hmm. You've got to change the number of places in that good job disco. And the only way you do that is by getting active in politics, starting today. And it is a lifetime job. Don't think, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote for Barack Obama, but don't think, I didn't come here to lie to you this morning. Don't think that's enough. If you think the job is over the day after election day, forget about it. 
you got to keep doing this for the rest of your life. Now, there are great satisfactions, by the way, and great psychic rewards, and sometimes even some monetary rewards in being a political activist. But the most important thing is, if you want to have enough jobs for your future and the future of your children and your grandchildren, you've right. got to become a so, very, very active citizen. So speaking of being an active citizen, Tram, you're here in Virginia with the Virginia New Majority. How do you, these young folk activate? Uh, how do they use their agency here in the state where they live and live, and many of them will live, raise families, and work, or at least want to work? That's a great question. Virginia New Majority is a statewide civic engagement organization that focuses primarily on activism, community organizing, and electoral organizing to make sure that our citizens and our community are as actively engaged as possible and at the decision-making table and impacting the decisions that our elected officials make um, that impact their daily lives. And so I think the key is being educated on the issues that impact your community, um, finding avenues to engage with your elected leaders, um, finding uh, opportunities to engage with your neighbors and your family and friends to really, to really change the public discourse around some of these key issues. And that's what we've seen in Virginia. You know, in, in the Commonwealth over the last several years, our public service programs and our social safety nets have been under attack. They have been subject to a lot of the issues that, you know, many other things are subject to in terms of budget issues and, and budget cuts. Um, and they're pitted against transportation, which those of you all who live here understand and know very well that the transportation crisis is pretty large. And so we have a governor who is, you know, thinking and has been trying for years to divert sales tax revenue um, from our public safety, from our school system, from our safety programs, and putting them into transportation. And it's a Band-Aid solution because it's not a long-term fix for transportation. And so while we're rating programs that we really need, our public services, our social safety net, we're not really fixing transportation either, and that's not a solution. And so over the years, we've engaged the community, we've engaged young people, old people alike, to make sure that we're fighting against these cuts. But fighting and playing defense isn't enough. We need to go on the offense, and we need to start thinking about ways and policies that we can engage and get our elected officials to pass that will strengthen our communities and empower us to build better lives for ourselves. Salute the work you're doing. But it seems to me one of the major challenges, and tell me how you're wrestling with this, is that among so many of our young people, they are just bombarded with market-driven messages of stimulation and titillation and lust, so they never really learn how to love. Because love is the most dangerous thing to do. It's, it's beautiful, but it's dangerous. You know what I mean? So you, you love learning, love justice, love your neighbor, and even love yourself. Mm -hmm. So that if you have the young folk pacified and sleepwalking, and then they never learn how to fight for justice. That's what Brother Jeff is talking about. They never learn how to fight for justice. They learn how to be careerists. They learn how to be smart so they can get an individual job. They learn how to gain assets to a position. That's not fighting for justice. They end up well adjusted to injustice while they're on their careers. How do you awaken our precious young folk? That's a great question. And I think, you know, I've over the last few years we've seen a shift. I mean, it starts with the young people themselves. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I have had the privilege of working with several T.C. William graduates over the last few years and mentoring them. I'll give an example of one particular young lady who, um, she's an immigrant, her family's from El Salvador. She, I think in her senior year, in the course of two months, moved six times because her family cannot afford the rent. Her father is disabled um, and cannot have a job, can't hold a job, can't find one. Her mother works two jobs, one as a cleaning lady and one as a sales uh, person at TJ Maxx down the road. And, you know, she came to us and said, how do I fix this? The system is broken. I'm going to be in this situation for the rest of my life. Can you help me? And so identifying students who feel the injustice and who want to engage their fellow students and their fellow young people to engage. So she became one of our top youth activists. Um, was key in building a youth movement. Um, she 
got a job, put herself through Northern Virginia Community College, got her associate's degree last year, now is transferred to a four-year college down in Richmond, first in her family to go to school. And she's, so people like her are the start, right? They're the seed of change. And for her to spread that message to her fellow young people is, I think, where we can begin. Dr. Henson. Um, Dr. Mady Henson, before I, I want to ask you a couple of questions, I think, but I want to start by, uh, since I teased you about this long title you have, uh, Deputy Superintendent of Student Support and Institutional Ad Advancement. What does that mean? What do you do every day? <laughs> It's Let me a good start with question. that. Well, yeah. we, can, we can shorten it first right. because uh, typically it's just deputy superintendent. Uh, um, you know, I have an incredible role of really supporting the, the superintendent in his um, drive to ensure that we have excellence and equity for all students here in Alexandria City Public Schools. Uh, you know, directly under my area are all of student support services. It is critical to this issue of poverty that includes all the social workers, all the counselors, the nurses, the psychologists, the wraparound support services that are in schools, sometimes invisible, uh, but are clearly needed to support the academic side of what's happening. When you have students in a population, as we do here in Alexandria City Public Schools, where nearly 60% of the students are eligible for free and reduced meals, what you know is that there are a lot of things going on in the lives of those young people. Mm -hmm. uh, they live very complicated lives, and uh, it is our role in working in collaboration with also uh, the agencies within the city, et cetera, to help to ensure that we shore that up so that a student can focus on what they need to do to get get through that so, so, so how does the how does the nation's school districts do that how, how do we do that better because again yes. I don't I don't know that there's anyone in his or her right mind I mean people a lot of people want to score points mm -hmm. by saying the problem with the black community or this community or that community is that they don't the, the, the kids got to get education they, they're not being educated in the way they should be so you can score political points by saying stuff like that mm -hmm. but anybody in their right mind has to acknowledge acknowledge as you've just said there is a direct link between learning yes. and those other services those That's support right. services that so many of these young people are lacking so if you take what Jeff said earlier this is the way of the future so how are our school systems our districts our infrastructure how are we going to handle that so I think there are, there are three uh, big bullets that I can put it under. One is uh, the issue of collaboration. No one person, no one institution, and no one sector can do this by themselves. Um, that we have to look at how do we work in concert with each other, the public sector, um, the business sector, the nonprofit sector. How do we work together to really do what we need to do to provide the support that's needed uh, um, for our young people? And education is the beginning. It is not the only answer, but it is the beginning to this solution. You have a fighting chance with an education. It doesn't guarantee that you're going to get that job, but without it, you can almost guarantee that you're not. And so part of our role is to realize and look at how do we find that collaborative force to work together so that we can shore that up and provide the safety net here. I think the other side is around cultural competency. Let's talk a little bit about that. When we look at our nation's schools, particularly in our, uh, the public education sector, uh, our schools are educating the masses here in this country. They are becoming browner and blacker as we look at that school system. I will also say if you look at the pipeline of who's educating our young people, and we look at coming out of um, the schools of education, they don't look a lot like our students oftentimes that they're educating. And so we also have to find ways of heightening that cultural competency so that you can provide the best education for those students. That means I need to understand who you are. I need to understand what are those things that are impacting you in your life. I can't make my perceptions about you get in the way of that. And so that is another one of those areas. Collaboratively, we need to be working closer with the higher education institutions to provide some addition for that. In addition to that, we've got to work with our own staffs to help provide that sensitivity. And the last thing I would say is courage. We all have to have the courage to stand up and call it when it needs to, because equity is different than equal, and we have to look at that and make sure that we're providing resources for needed. I'm glad, and that's, yeah. I think that's, that's, that's mm -hmm. in so many ways a crucial one. No, you want to rush this? Just because I mean, this issue of courage mm -hmm. there's such a paucity of courage these days in our market-driven society. Because courage is about greatness. Yes, it is. Courage is about sacrifice. Yes. 
and not just monetary gain in that sense. And so I, I want to accent that. But when uh, Brother Morton Sherman talked about honoring teachers, elevating yes. teachers, it reminds me of Finland. We know Finland's number one in the world in education. Yes. 95% yes. of their teachers unionize small classes, parental involvement, a culture of cooperation and accountability, not just choice That's right. and competition. That's right. And at the same time, it's a way of saying, you know what? This is a major priority, but only 3% of their country live in poverty. In America, the top 1% of the students score even better than Finland. That's right. Introduce poverty with 20 something. That's right. So this connection between poverty and education, I think Brother Jeff was talking about, right. in which is the beginning and necessary, not a sufficient. We got structural challenges here. Let me, uh, I, I hear the music from the house band, which means I gotta go to a break. Before I go and uh, have to say thank you for coming on, let me run down the, run down the road right quick, and give you each 20 seconds. I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Henson. What makes you hopeful? Given what you're up against every day, vis-a-vis -vis poverty and these young people trying to get a good education, excellence and equity, what makes you hopeful right quick? What makes me hopeful is the fact that we see evidence that it's being done. Um, Dr. Sherman mentioned that in our two highest poverty schools in this school division, we have the highest actual academic achievement in entire Alexandria City Public Schools. And it's outperforming even the state in many areas. So the hope is there because the evidence is there. We just need to do it school by school. Please thank Dr. Mady Henson for being with us today. Tram win. What makes you what makes you hopeful given what you're what you're trying to do here in Virginia? What makes me hopeful is that people are waking up finally to the crisis that we're facing and more and more people are being engaged. You know, we reach out to the most vulnerable populations, the folks that a lot of people forget about, and the fact that they are waking up and saying, how can I be involved? You know, how do I advocate? How do I go down to the Capitol and tell my legislator what I need them to know? I think that gives me a lot of hope. With the Virginia New Majority, please thank Tram Wynn. And we were in where we began and I'm not going to ask you what makes you hopeful, Jeff. I'm going to ask you, given that you've written the book, are you hopeful? Uh, yes. Okay, now I'm tell hope, me why. I am, I am hopeful. Uh, James Baldwin once said that not everything that's faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed if it's not faced. That's right. I am hopeful that as these 20, 30-somethings, 40-somethings who've got a college education begin to understand that they're in the same boat as the single mom trying to make, get, get through and uh, pay the rent, then I think the tipping point is going to come in this The country. new book from Jeff Foe is called The Servant Economy, where America's elite is sending the middle class. Please thank Jeff Foe. There you have some solutions to poverty in America. You're listening to The Poverty Tour 2.0 from Alexandria, Virginia, T.C. Williams High School. The program continues in a moment. It's being brought to you by Pacifica and Native Voice One. Live. Cornell West Theory. Cornell West Theory. We are live from T.C. Williams High School in Alexandria, Virginia, day two of our Poverty Tour 2.0, taking us to four battleground states as we try to push poverty higher up on the American agenda. I want to jump right in. We only have about seven minutes with him, and I want to make sure that we make the most of that. Uh, he is a congressman out of the great state of Ohio. Uh, and one of the most progressive members of Congress. Please welcome oh, yeah. Congressman Dennis Kucinich, yes. former presidential Long aspirant distance himself. Long for freedom. Thank you. Long distance struggling for justice. Why, you saw the poverty numbers yesterday. You saw the job numbers last week. Why are things this bad in America? Well, uh, one reason 
is a piece of legislation that's up, and this is the reason I'm going to have to leave pretty soon, uh, and that is they're continuing to fund these wars. And we're going to, today, another $100 billion going in for the uh, wars overseas. And Nobel Prize winning economist Paul um, uh, Joseph Stiglitz and his assistant Linda Bilmes wrote a book called The Three Trillion Dollar War. By now, Iraq could go to four, five trillion dollars the cost. The cost of the war in Afghanistan could be well over a trillion dollars. We cannot, we cannot have jobs for all, health care for all, education for all, housing for all, if we continue to spend trillions of dollars going around the world looking for dragons to slay while we ignore problems right here at home. We've got to stop these wars. We're no safer. What, it, what is the link? Dr. King famously said that war is the enemy of the poor. That's Martin King, that war is the enemy of the poor. In a contemporary sense, since you made the case, Congressman Kucinich, what is the link between war and poverty? Well, it's a direct link because the money that's, the trillions of dollars that are being spent on war are, are actually, they're money that should be spent on housing, on education, on job creation. There's a direct connection. A budget is about choices that are made. And we're making choices to spend money on military buildups, more money for the Pentagon, less money for cities, less money for communities, less money for job creation, less money for education. This is, and people need to be aware, these are conscious choices that are being made, frankly, by both Democrats and Republicans. I'm a Democrat, I'm gonna support the president, but I have to tell you, I disagree with an economic program that keeps putting the, our money overseas in terms of wars and drones and things like that. It's not just immoral, but it's destructive to America and our dreams for the future. But you know, there's so many, many fellow citizens who agree with you, but it looks as if our political system is so corrupted by big money. It is. So that the voices of the folk can't translate into the kind of legislation that you're talking about. How do, how do you break that well, law, well, Jim, unless you know, we just hit the streets and go to jail, though, brother? There's money on two levels we're talking about. Uh, now, you know, people used to think, talk about the Federal Reserve, it's some right-wing uh, issue. No, it's not. How money is made is a central issue in our economy. In 1913, the money supply was privatized. Congress used to have the authority under Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution to create money to, to basically, it says coin money, but to create money and use that money to meet the needs of the nation. Now the Federal Reserve creates money out of nothing and gives it to banks, which park the money in accounts at the Fed, don't create jobs, don't loan money to businesses to create jobs, just helps the rich get richer. We need to reclaim the power, and I've got a bill to do this, H.R. 2990, National Employment Emergency Defense Act. Reclaim the power, Congress needs to get that power back, we have to stop these banks from creating money out of nothing and giving it to, to basically to other wealthy interest groups, depriving our p country of the resources that we need. We can regain control of our destiny, but we've got to regain control of monetary policy. Now, the other issue is the fact that you look at that capital, it's the world's biggest auction. Policy goes to the highest bidder. And the highest bidder is because of Buckley versus Vallejo, Citizens United. We must have a new constitutional amendment which says no private money in public elections at all. We need public funding, public control of the election process, private funding, private corruption of the public uh, government. So, I know I'm, you know, that's what it's about, you know, and I'm going to have to leave in a minute. No, I know you, I'm, I'm yeah. suspicious. But, brother, I'm suspicious of constitutional amendments because black people had constitutional amendments in the 1860s, and we're still traumatized, terrorized, I and stigmatized you. with white supremacy. That's on paper. We're talking about practice. Do we have what it takes to enforce what's on paper, even if we get it on paper? If we can get a constitutional amendment that would ban all private spending, that would be huge. And, frankly, uh, right now, but, we, no, but loopholes. I mean, we no, had no, antitrust. No, no, it would be no. It would we had be antitrust laws in the 1890s. Corporations got I, bigger. Look, look, I understand that, you, but I'm uh, saying that the states would have to participate. We'd have to get legislatures to participate. I think if there's yeah. enough of an uprising, look at what's happening. I mean, uh, 
there, there's already targeting of Social Security, which Social Security is rock solid through the year 2032 without any changes whatsoever. Wall Street wants to get its, its mitts on Social Security. We, we, you know, we still have these wars which are diverting spending. We have a trade deficit of five to six hundred billion dollars. The tax cuts t accelerated the wealth upwards. All the whole country is designed to take the massive wealth of the people, put it to the top, and that's not a way a democracy I, can survive. I know you have to run, so quick exit question. Um, when the poverty numbers came out yesterday, uh, Mr. Obama made a statement, Mr. Romney made a statement, Mr. Romney uh, I guess channeling George Bush, you recall George Bush said years ago, read my lips, you know, no new taxes. He wanted you to know where he stood, at least in the campaign. Somehow I think if Mr. Romney is elected, he will keep the promise that he made yesterday. And about poverty, he said that he had a program to lift up poor people, but he said, let me be clear, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, let me be clear, there will be cuts. We're starting to hear more talk about austerity in Washington. If Mr. Romney were to win, we know stuff is going to be cut. How much does that concern you? Well, the, the economic program I'm hearing out of that campaign sounds like Richard Nixon's secret plan to end the war. You know, I mean, they're, they're, going, they're not going to tell you right now, but afterwards they'll tell you and what it is, it's more cuts. Look. We already have 10 million people out of work. We have another 13 million are underemployed. We have people given up hope of having a job and they've fallen off uh, the, the uh, uh, numbers that come out of Bureau of Labor Statistics because the unemployment rate is much higher than 8.1%. Mm. So we're, we're looking at a situation where the economics of both parties, look, I'm a Democrat. I've been involved in public life since 1967. Mm. I was a mayor of Cleveland in 1977. Mm. I'm a Demo and, and I had to defeat both parties to get there. But I will tell you something. Well, being a Democrat, my own party hasn't done right on jobs. We had control of the Congress, yes, and yes, we didn't create yes. the jobs. Yes, so yes. excuse me. You know, yes. I'm saying that we, we need a new economics that will create jobs for all. You know, today, I just came from a committee meeting where the Republicans passed a, a bill that attacks uh, some of the changes that the Obama administration trying to make in, in, uh, in, in uh, getting people from uh, welfare to work. And I said, well, isn't this something? We've got 10 million people out of work, and we're still attacking people who have had to have some kind of assistance. It's like blaming the victims. We need to rally the American people across economic lines to create a full employment economy. We need to change our monetary policy so the government has the ability to do that, rebuild America. There's enough work, to, work that needs to be done. There's enough people who need to work. We need to reclaim our country, stop these wars abroad, take care of things here at home. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman Kucinich. Good to have you on the program. I, I know you got to get back to the Hill where they need you and where we need you. One more time for Congressman Dennis Kucinich, Democrat out of Ohio, former presidential aspirant, and speaking of folk who have run for president on the other side of this break, America's consumer advocate extraordinaire, former candidate for the White House himself. We're joined in a moment by Ralph Nader. Come on up, Ralph Nader, to the stage. This program, The Poverty Tour 2.0, is distributed by Pacifica and Native Voice One. Rise up. 
on the war campaign. Manchurian throne, now the new king reigns. Though it could have been the queen, jump, jack in the box. Christ versus Muhammad in the terrorist watch. Federal agents in plain clothes Nazis. Activists framed for armed robbery. Shotguns aim. It's a shame what they did to Lil Bobby. Through the heart, out the body. Accident Harley. They rather crush the opposition party. They assassinated Buto. John the Baptist prayed, preached away, and then came Ernesto Che. Either roll with the gospel or stay out the city of magnificent distance where patriots do business. The South gave Mike Bell a harsh life sentence. Distance is the gun of the resistance. So we pledge allegiance to the poor in the war torn streets with political, spiritual, cultural speech. This is patriotic me, me. Mother births boy and girl, grateful for country she resides in. High as the flag waves inverted, patriots hopeful, but living in the worst of burdens. Child grow to man, protect homeland that's burning, while my civil independence is stripped, killing for preemptive miscreants. These dominion idiots will breeze double things. The collectivist bait is false, flags and woe on brink us. Sheep will digital prisons, but true patriotism is individualism. Palace of wilderness, Pentagon past the place, hawk and face. Your faith breaks, then time stinks. So I wonder, do mothers contemplate to take life? When they find out the truth that hid in her womb was groomed as a blood sacrifice, but magic sells commanders in business, super soldiers, psyop lynchings, science adolescent henchmen, dying for Uncle Baphomet's intention, but true patriotism is individual. <laughs> Cornell West Theory, rise up, awake, shadow to sleep walking. We are back live at T.C. Williams High School in Alexandria, Virginia. Day two of our four battleground state, Poverty Tour 2.0. Yesterday, Ohio, today, Virginia, tomorrow, Philadelphia, and Saturday, uh, West Palm Beach, Florida. And... Uh, Okay. Yay for West Palm. Um, we are delighted uh, to have on the stage now somebody we've been waiting to talk to. We had, uh, uh, we've had a couple of iconic Americans already on this stage today, so I hope that the young people uh, are, are, are taking this in. Uh, and um, I know that years from now they will be able to say that they were once in the same room with Peter Edelman. Uh, they were in the same room with Dolores Huerta, and one day, they will tell their kids and their grandkids that they actually met Ralph Nader. Please welcome Ralph Nader. Yeah. 
Uh, dear Brother Ralph, we've been talking about shattering this sleepwalker, and there's been no one I know of your generation who's been trying to shatter the numbness and sleepwalking of fellow citizens to wake up, fight for justice, connect the life of the mind to serious transformation of society. What's on your mind at the moment, bro? <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, there's not many people like you, uh, Cornell West and Tavis Smiley, who are going around uh, saying the truth, even though we have a black president, saying the truth. That's important. Uh, nobody escapes the truth, no matter what, color, creed, religion, that's and true. that's what they stand for. And if you don't think that takes courage in an ocean of cowardliness in our society, think again. So I want to... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, the subject is poverty, obviously. It's a poverty tour. And there's some things people need to know about poverty if they're not impoverished. And one is that half the country is in poverty. The Department of Labor figures are absurd. If you make $24,000 before deductions as a family of four, you're not considered poor by the Department of Labor. If you go to 40,000 mm, right. with family of four, likely not even having health insurance, you're poor. That's half of the 300 and nearly 20 million people in this country. This is why I call our country an advanced third world nation. By advanced, and let me explain. By advanced, I mean we have the biggest military, technology, and empire in the world. We have the most advanced computerized uh, economy in the world. And we have what might be called the most advanced science in the world. But how about how people live every day? Just think of this. 50 million people according to the latest statistics, men, women, children, having trouble getting enough food to get through the day. Mm -hmm. 50 million. This is in a country that produces more agricultural product than any country in the world. Just think of this one. One out of every three workers in this country makes less than 10.50 an hour before deductions. Just think of this. Wow. 58,000 Americans die from workplace-related diseases. Most of these people are poor or lower income. They have the most dangerous jobs, breathing toxic chemicals at work, taking in particulates that give them lung disease, or working in unsafe workplaces. What's the definition here of safety? The definition is quite clear. If the hazard to Americans come from so-called stateless terrorists abroad, trillions of dollars will be spent, because that makes big money for the military-industrial complex that was condemned by President Eisenhower in his farewell speech as a fundamental threat to our economy and our liberties. He warned us about the military-industrial complex, Lockheed Martin now, Boeing, Raytheon, for which no weapon systems are enough. It's never enough to have aircraft carriers that we don't need, to have fighter planes that we don't need, to have nuclear subs that we don't need. We've got enough to blow up the world 300 times and make the rubble bounce. Now look at the comparison. This is what empire means. Last year, taxpayers spent $675 million to guard the giant U.S. Embassy in Baghdad and its personnel, 675 million. Last year, OSHA was allowed to spend only 550 million dollars, that's the Occupational Safety and Health Agency, to deal with an epidemic of death and disease that totals about 60,000 Americans, workplace-related disease and trauma, not to mention all the sickness and the illness every day. That kind of contrast is what defines empire. We've got soldiers in over 100 countries, hundreds of military bases, no major enemy. The Soviet Union is gone. Communist China is not going to send missiles 
they want our jobs and industry, which our companies are obliging them with. So we spend this kind of money, and you know what happens to empires? They neglect their own people because they spend so much money on empire, and eventually they devour themselves. All empires devour themselves. So when you hear all these politicians flatter our soldiers, day after day you might wonder, why do all these politicians in Congress constantly flatter our soldiers? One reason is that they don't have any children in the armed forces, with very few exceptions. Mm. A second, mm. they don't have any skin in the game. The second is they have to flatter them because they're sending them to kill or die all over the world in unconstitutional criminal wars of aggression. And when they come home, they forget about them, especially the ones that are traumatized especially the ones that have serious mental health problems because they experience killing innocent families and children. And if you don't think soldiers get traumatized by that because they got all the bells and whistles when they come home, talk to some of them. Talk to their nightmares. Mm. Now let's get back to the poverty issue directly. We're an advanced third world country. Don't let anybody brag about the United States of America being first because it's no longer first. It's, it's about 17th in wages. 16 countries have higher wages. It used to be first. It's about 24 in infant mortality. 23 companies, countries, including Cuba, have a lower infant mortality. In terms of consumer debt, we're number one. In terms of being a debtor to the rest of the world, we're number one. We used to be the number one creditor in 1980. Now we owe the world. We're the ones who are exporting jobs and creating these trade deficits. We're the ones who are consuming more than we're producing. As we allow U.S. corporations, and bear witness to this, we are allowing these giant U.S. corporations who rose to profit on the backs of American workers, who when they got in trouble went to Washington and were bailed out on the backs of American taxpayers, who when they got in trouble overseas were able to call on the U.S. Marines to save them. And what is their response to the American people? To the American worker? Is it gratitude? Heck no. Their response is, we're out of here with millions of your jobs and your industries to communist and fascist regimes overseas like China who know how to keep their workers in their place at 50 cents an hour shipping products back into this country. Now if that doesn't begin to raise the question of how come we're such a rich country with so many poor people? It's because the top 1% has financial wealth equivalent to the combined 95% of the American people. The bottom 95%, that's almost everybody, have financial wealth equal to the top 1%. Now what does this mean in terms of our own <clears throat> fire in the belly? It doesn't matter how much you know if you don't have emotional intelligence. That's what the psychologists call fire in the belly. Rosa Parks was only one person who knew that you had to go to the rear of the bus in Montgomery, Alabama, if you were black. But she had fire in her belly. So did the 16-year-old black girl who preceded her and who refused to go to the back of the bus. Those workers in the 1930s, the auto workers in Michigan, they didn't have a union. They were badly mistreated and badly paid, and they had dangerous work conditions. And they went on strike. They had no unemployment compensation, no other money for their families. They went on strike for their dignity and to build the United Auto Workers. They had fire in their belly. The problem with so many young people today, 
is when it comes to injustice, they don't have fire in their belly. When it comes to name calling, gender, race, sexual preference, ethnic background, they go crazy. When it comes to verbal insults, this generation is unmatched in its indignation. When it comes to deeds, the actual devastation in our inner cities and in the rural areas and in people dying because they can't afford health insurance, the young generation with few luminous exceptions don't have fire in their belly. They're too busy looking at their gadgets, too busy text messaging, too busy physically growing up. Mm. Now, mm. now, I'm going to give you something to do and show you how you can make an impact. The way to turn this country around, as Dr. West and Tavis Smiley have been saying all over the country, is to change the priorities of our public mm. budgets. Mm. So they don't go from the many to the few, the many taxpayers to the few, rich. So they don't go to killing and destroying people in countries overseas who present no threat to us. Over a million Iraqis have died as a result of our invasion. Over a million. Five million refugees displaced in neighboring countries, cast away from their homes. Millions more are sick a country that never threatened us, a country that was invaded by Bush and Cheney's lies, deceptions, fabrications, which are well known now, not even challenged. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Tell it, Ralph. Now, how do you turn the public budgets around mm -hmm. so that your schools are not crumbling, your public transit is up to date, safe and reliable, so your libraries are well equipped and accessible so that your community health centers are ready to heal you without taking away your life savings. How do you do that? It starts with something called Congress. Congress is by far the most powerful branch of government under the Constitution. It has the taxing power, the spending power, the oversight investigating power, the war-making power, the nomination confirmation power, you name it, it completely outclasses the executive and judicial branches. And the founders meant it that way. That means we're down to 535 men and women who put their shoes on every day like you and me. Most of them are not like Dennis Kucinich. Very few of them are like Dennis Kucinich. Most of them want to get reelected. They know it takes money to get reelected. So they open themselves up for bidding to the highest bidder. Every one of them, 435 from the House of Representatives, they come from districts. Each district has high schools, colleges, community colleges. Each district has about 650,000 people. Each district has thousands of serious bird watchers. Each district has no full-time Congress watchers. And yet, if somebody knocked on your door tomorrow and said, hi, I just wanted to tell you I'm your new neighbor, and I spend 22% of your money I can send your children off to war. I can raise your taxes. I can let corporations and credit card companies rip you off. And I can do a lot of other things. See you later. Walks away down the sidewalk. You're standing in the doorway. What are you saying? You're saying, how dare this person interrupt me? I was in my 88th text message today. <laughs> or are you going to say, hey, that's my member of Congress. 
he means a lot to me or she means a lot to me therefore I better mean something to them come on back here because if your neighbor spent 22 percent of your income that could send your family off to war and expose you to toxic waste and make sure you couldn't get a good paying job wouldn't you take an interest okay now I'm gonna show you as high school students how you can become real power factors in the Congress this isn't just theory I'm gonna so challenge you and make it so easy for you that you won't be able to escape other than by joining the National Society of Apathetics <laughs> okay the hardest thing to do is to recognize that 15 corporate thousand corporations 1500 rather 1500 corporations you know them General Motors uh, uh, U US Steel Nucor uh, Prudential Citigroup Exxon uh, Walmart uh, 1500 corporations get their way the way they want it with a majority of the 535 men, men and women in Congress how do you get the member of Congress attention you don't contribute to their campaigns you call up and you say I want to speak to senator so-and-so from Virginia or congressman so-and-so from Virginia and they're already looking at the computer to see whether you're a contributor and if you are a big contributor you get through if you gave 25 bucks you might get a staffer but if you're just an ordinary citizen who doesn't give money to campaigns you won't even get an intern that happened to be there from T.S. Williams High School so how do you get their attention <clears throat> here's how you get their attention you can go to the computer and find out what companies and what company executives are contributing to the members okay that's all public information bing 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 you got it you get the printout then you go to your graphic art students you got graphic art students you got artists here I'm sure you do and you say we we want your involvement and then you get a picture of your senator or representative and you give it to the graphic arts student and you give them the logos of the companies and let me tell you three-year-olds <laughs> recognize a lot of logos of these companies coca-cola for example what do you want for, to drink dearie coke you know <laughs> like a, a little bird you know the mother bird what do you want to drink age 18 months coke so you get all the logos because they want to plant the logos on your brain from two years on okay now look what happens how do you get the attention of your member of Congress you show who owns them how do you show who owns them in a very personal way you give them a poster jacket with the logos on the jacket wrapped around the head of the picture of the member of Congress less than you need more graphics here's what I'm talking about speaker speaker John Boehner he's a corporation who's been a masquerading as a human being okay now here's here's his jacket here's his jacket we call it the congressional jacket it's got Exxon Mobil that's a big one contributed to him Sally Mae the ripoff company on student loans the gouging company huh? that that company owns him he was single-handedly blocking reform on student loans for years single-handedly pouring money into him whining dining him golf tournaments you name it Monsanto uh, they want to genetically engineer nature and they want to own your own genes with monopoly patents they actually own human gene sequences how do you like that years ago corporations called cotton plantations 
They own slaves. They can't own slaves anymore. Now they want to own your jeans. Okay, Walmart. Why is Walmart contributing to Speaker Boehner? Because Walmart wants to freeze the minimum wage at seven dollars and a quarter. Now the minimum wage, if it kept up with inflation from 1968, would be ten dollars an hour. Ten dollars and thirty-six cents, to be exact, an hour. You know how many workers are working between seven dollars and a quarter and ten dollars an hour? Thirty million. Thirty million American workers. Now. You think this is going to get John Boehner's attention? Well, the next step is pretty easy. You go to people in the district and you collect some money. You collect some money because you want to give it to a tailor. And the tailor makes the jacket, the Boehner jacket, with all the logos. Now, this is not a normal jacket. You're not going to get it for $300 or $200 or $100 because it's very hand work. Once you get the jacket, then you go around the district and say, we're going to give this congressman the jacket. By this time, there's an uproar in the office in the Capitol. They've never seen anything like this before. Because it comes up, they printed this in the paper, it's been on TV, <laughs> it's been subject to talk radio. Oh, you're going to, all over the country, high school students are in the job of giving the member of Congress the jacket to show who owns them. Now, is there anybody who can stop you from doing that? Whenever you go through life and you say, ah, whatever will be, will be. You can't fight City Hall. You can't fight the politicians. You can't fight Exxon Mobil. You can't fight Pfizer. You can't fight Bank of America. Ask yourself this question. How much can you do how much can you do that no one can stop you from doing? Half a democracy is showing up at marches, demonstrations, city council meeting, courts of law, elections. Nobody can stop you from doing that. So start taking yourself seriously, high school students of America, because you can lead the fight with exactly what you have in your hands and in your minds for your own future the future of your children and grandchildren, the future of your company, country and the world. You turn America around. You do great things for the world. This is the first time this has been unveiled. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ralph, Ralph Nader. Nader. Ralph Nader. One and Ralph only Ralph Nader. Nader. Brother Ralph, Ralph Nader. Nader. One and only Brother Ralph Nader. This is, fire in his belly. this is a historic moment. I've been doing public television and public radio for the majority of my career. I've been at this now, Ralph, for 20 years in, in broadcast media. And in 20 years, the record that I had was asking Fidel Castro three questions in a six-hour interview. I got three questions out in a six-hour interview with Fidel Castro. We asked Ralph Nader What's on One your mind? Question. What's on your mind? <laughs> and Ralph Nader gave it up, and I love it. <laughs> he came with and, it. And we don't have a single question to ask. However, we have about 13 minutes left in this program. There's a microphone right here to my left. And for any young person, especially the young people, or anybody, turn the lights up, please, house lights up. Please, There's a microphone to my right left forward. in this aisle. Come You've been right patient forward. for three hours for this entire show. We want to give the last 15 minutes to your quick questions or comments for Ralph Nader or anything we've well, discussed please, today. Please, please turn line. the lights up. There's a microphone here to the left. And please don't all jump at once, but any young and, person, any adult, anybody. And, and as you come to the microphone, I told you before, it is Tavis Smiley's birthday, and there's been 20 students here at this magnificent high school who are in the culinary class, and they've brought some uh, cupcakes, I think. Yeah. Bring it quick, real quick, real quick, real quick, real quick. Oh, here it is. Thanks so much, though, brother. Thank you. I gotta come back to, to come back here more often. Thanks for the cupcakes and thanks for the birthday wishes. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks for culinary arts students. We got a cupcakes. we got a few minutes. Let's let's jump. Questions, comments for Ralph Nader, anything he said, or anything else we've covered today. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Little mention has been made of alternatives to our economic system. Uh, very little. And I heard of a system called circular economy, whereby you reduce the waste of uh, human resources, natural resources, infrastructure, so on. I hope everybody puts a finger on this subject and looks it up because it does sound promising. Thank we got you. it. Ralph, you, you, don't, you want to comment on that? In it? He, he said, Ralph's a good idea. Circular economy. We'll look it up. We love getting good ideas on the road. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity. I am standing here. Talk only. a little closer now, Michael. Just bend it down. You're a little okay. short. I think you. I'm either. standing here <laughs> only for the sake of my daughter. She is six, and I already told Dr. West about her. She is incredible. She's very bright. She attends a school here in the Alexandria City Public Schools. I graduated from the city public schools and from a major state university. I am unemployed. I am unassisted. I have been denied based on, as Mr. Nader so eloquently said, I'm expected to live off of my life savings. And I want to work. I have worked for people who are in this room. What am I to do? I don't have a lot of savings. It's an IRA. It's my own personal savings. It is not a lot. The only thing I can do right now is ask as a plea for any other single mom. I fled my marriage, and I don't want to get too personal, but I feel I'm punished by the system to, to have no support whatsoever. I'm trying to remember everything I want to say, but again, I'm standing here for my daughter. Um, the other thing I do want to say is I attended the new home ownership program. I have excellent credit. I cannot seek a home right now because I'm told I need to make at least 30000 and that's through Arlington, not even here in Alexandria. I've gone and knocked on the door, been inside the offices. I've been told here in Alexandria, and I don't want to put my city down. I grew up here. But I've been told many times, because I went more than once, you should go to Fairfax, you should go to Arlington. I, I, I don't want to take up too much time, but I later learned why that was being said. It's because the voucher program is transferable. You can get a voucher in your state, but you can also move within the country. So again, I'm standing here for her. She. No, I, she deserves better. Every child does. So I speak for her. I speak absolutely. for every single mom. First of all, first of all, I, I, I'm trying to watch our time, but I, I want to tell you um, how much uh, Doc and I appreciate your courage Thank you. in coming forth to say that. And you should know that as we've traveled this country talking about this issue, we have seen this time and time and time again. Americans who through no fault of their own, but in large part, Ralph, because of corporate greed and political indifference, find themselves unemployed. And these stories are heartbreaking. They are heartbreaking for me every single time I hear them. But this is the face of poverty in America. We told you earlier today that women and children are falling faster into poverty than anybody else in this society. We started the day, this, the very first thing I did this morning, three hours ago, was to read to you a story in your local paper, the Alexandria Times, about the condition of poverty in this city. Um, so while it is prosperous for many, while it is a model city in so many ways, this is what happens all across the country. Uh, and so I, I wish, I wish, and Dr. West wishes, and I'm sure Ralph Nader wishes, that we had jobs to pass out as we travel around the country. But we're pulling for you, we're praying for you. Um, but this is why this issue matters. This is why we let Ralph Nader go as long as he wanted to go. And I think he was brilliant in the way he presented this. This young people, this young people is why you are here today. This is why this issue matters. You heard her say that she grew up in this town. She went to school in this town. She got a college degree in this state. She got married in this state. She has a child that she birthed in this state. 
and this is potentially what can happen to you down the road through no fault of your own and this is what we don't want to have happen to you and this is why Ralph Nader laid out for you what you have to do is to be involved you've got to civically engage so that this doesn't end up being your situation but I thank you for your courage and for one, one, one last point my dear sister and that is that uh, what Tavis is saying in part is that this is a love tour and we care. That's right. And we do hope, and as a Christian I pray, that there might be somebody in the room who's connected to something in this county that could be of assistance to our dear sister and her precious child. Your child is as precious as any other child in this county. You are as precious as any other child in this county. I don't know, I don't know folk that well in Alexandria, but we want to let you know that there's a, we're not the only ones, there's a number of folk who care? They come in all colors. They come in all religions. They come in all genders. I'm gonna let Ralph Nader respond. That I've got time for one more question here, and then we're gonna have to we're gonna hit this wall for this. Uh, I just want no, to say, this, this sister waiting. Yeah, there's a woman waiting in front of you, sister. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Ralph. Yeah, I just want to say, uh, right after World War II, there was a Humphrey Hawkins uh, law passed, Full Employment Act, and it, it declared that the uh, responsibility of the federal government is to be the employer of last resort. There's a lot of work done uh, to be done for which there aren't enough jobs. People have forgotten about that because we don't control Congress. Congress passed that a few decades ago. Full employment, if you can't find a job, the government is the employer of last resort for important and needy uh, jobs. So this, this is why it's so important to have at high schools a course called Congress 101 <clears throat> where you study <clears throat> daily and feed it out on the internet Everything your senator or representative that you st who you study do every day. Yeah. And you'll see the power that we will, you will accrete over these uh, members of Congress because you're watching them and diffusing it to thousands of people in their district. I'm going to take a couple more questions right quick. Before I do that, though, let me tell you, for those in the room uh, who were as moved as I was by Ralph Nader's brilliant presentation, he has a new book that's just about to come out. So write this down or at least remember it. Ralph Nader, The 17 Solutions. Ralph Nader. The 17 Solutions, Bold Ideas for Our American Future. Again, it's Ralph Nader, The 17 Solutions. Remember that or write it down. The book will be out in October. So it's coming out in just a matter of weeks, and we're delighted to. I'm glad, glad to have my hands on a copy in advance of it even coming out. But this is the new book from Ralph Nader, The 17 Solutions. Let me squeeze in one or two quick questions, and then we'll, uh, we've got to wrap this up because our time is just up, and the school's been so kind to have us, but we got I'm to move. I'm a former TC uh, teacher from history and government teacher. My question for Mr. Nader is, I had a friend in Alabama who studied Bill Gates for decades, and I asked him, is Bill Gates evil or misguided? And he said, well, depending on who you talk, some people think he's e evil, I think he's misguided. How do we get our corporations who are on the right side of liberal, who are trying to do the right thing, to also stand up and do the right thing? Because I see a lot of corporations that are misguided going toward education programs that seem like they're for the kids, but they're not, and working for programs that are for public education, but they're in effect trying to privatize education in this country. How do we make them also step up to the plate? Well, you, you need to uh, put pressure on them all kinds of ways. I mean, you get Congress to put pressure on them to pay a living wage and to, to stop poisoning the environment. Uh, you, you, uh, you have more unions by uh, getting uh, uh, improved labor rights so people can form unions, which are more difficult to form in our country than any other Western country. Uh, you use the vote to have a multi-party political system. Uh, here in, in Virginia, you can vote for the Green Party which is far more uh, espousing of majoritarian agendas for workers, patients, consumers, environment, and peace in the world than the other major parties. So you gotta do that, but you gotta convey the language in a very serious way. Poverty, when you are poor, poor people die more, they get sick more, they're unemployed more, they can't spend the time with their family because they're terrorized more where they live. I mean, it, it has very, very uh, serious con 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 uh, consequences. It isn't just not having enough money right. to put food on the table. You look at all the figures and the mortality, morbidity figures, et cetera, the debt figures, the debt collectors harassing them, the police harassing them uh, because they're poor. You know, they look suspicious. And so we've got to get the, get the movement going right where you are. Congress 101, this poster, 
go to the colleges, this get the neighborhoods organized. There is 1% of the energy of the people can turn this country around. This is going to be our last question. Uh, let me, before, I, before I take it, though, let me just say that on our website, smileyandwest.com, this conversation is continuing as we move around the country. Let's go to smileyandwest.com. Doc and I are reading the questions. We're answering questions. So we know in these settings we can't get everything out. Uh, but this conversation continues literally 24 hours. We're on the bus traveling and going everywhere. So we're checking this stuff out and responding to it and Facebooking and tweeting and all that good stuff. So make sure that you... Um, um, you uh, give us your questions online since we can't get them today. Now, I'm a member of Kappa Alpha Psi, uh, but I'm, I, I got nothing against Alpha Men. And, so and, and since Dr. That. West since on? Dr. West is Alpha Man, we're going to let Alpha Brother ask the last question. Yeah. I'm so sorry to hear that, uh, Brother. Yeah, Smiley. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. We, we, pray for, we pray for the Brother. Yeah, yeah. What's going on? Hey, uh, thank you for taking my question. I just want to let you know that as a member of the military, I'm very appreciative to be here today with my wife. Uh, and we really, really appreciate you all bringing such. Uh, a heavy focus to something that impacts us all. Because as the president said, there but for the grace of God go I. So this can reach out and touch any of us just as a young lady here. Uh, that said, I just want to get your thoughts on some of the stuff that's going on in the airwaves. Uh, one night, uh, last night in my class, we were discussing about the No Child Left Behind with the teachers, uh, uh, their value added, basically the critique that puts them out of work after one year when they get evaluated. How do you come down on that? What are your thoughts on that in relation to what's going on in Chicago when sometimes the teachers union, okay, I don't know if it's a second or third order effect, lends to kids being hungry because when the teachers go on strike, these kids can't eat. Sometimes the system and our proposed solutions to the problem becomes the problem in and of itself. I wanted to get your thoughts on that and then going into the political season, uh, this cycle, Remember when President Obama was talking about the uh, school down in uh, South Carolina that was very drippy and all that type of thing? What is your take on education and the upgrades that we've done? Well, you got a lot on the table, my dear brother. But uh, I mean, one is that uh, we've alluded to what's going on in Chicago. And uh, my view is that it's a historic moment in the history of not just the battle over the status of teachers and their honor and their sense of calling, not just career, but it's a historic moment in the labor movement because the labor movement have been, has been under such intense attack for so long. We had a similar struggle in New York City with the mayor there and we did not reach this level of, uh, of engagement and clashing as it were. So everywhere we go, we've talked about not just our profound solidarity with the teachers in Chicago, but all the vicious lies that have been told about teachers uh, uh, in the media. Well, I was just reading both the Times as well as the Washington Post. It seems to me they don't really want to tell the truth, the full truth about what the teachers have undergone. They always highlight the teachers who somehow are not doing what they ought to do. And there's always going to be in any profession people who are not doing what they ought to do. There's politicians, there's doctors, there's lawyers, there are professors who don't do what they ought to do. But why not highlight the teachers who are so sacrificial, who've been at it for so long, who give so much of what they are, sometimes out of their own pockets, and still have to deal with wage freezes year after year after year. And if we can't elevate our teachers who are the caretakers of our children, then what kind of society are we really? And so in that sense, the destiny of the nation regarding the precious lives of our, of our, our youth is at stake here. And so we've been very clear about that, but we had discussions about this. The superintendent introduced this theme from the very beginning, our dear brother Morton, yeah. Morton introduced it from the very beginning, and that's, that, that's part and parcel of this talk about poverty, uh -huh. and that's part and parcel of what this tour is about. Before you move, before you move, before you move, let me run this list of persons that I am so grateful to for welcoming us here to the state of Virginia uh, and for doing everything they could to make this visit um, so, uh, so successful. Let me uh, run their names and ask you to hold your applause until we can get to the end and thank all. And first of all, uh, to the students, the administrators, the entire staff here at T.C. Williams High School, we thank you. To our media partners, WMMJ, Magic 102.3, the Radio One station, of course, in Washington. To ACPS-TV, Alexandria City Public Television Station. 
uh, Channel 71, to our community partners, Alexandria City Schools, Virginia New Majority, uh, Reston Interfaith, Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, their chairman here earlier on this program, to our house band, the Cornell West Theory, uh, to Superintendent uh, Sherman, we thank you. Deputy Superintendent Hen Henson, we thank you as well. Uh, and uh, some special friends of ours here at uh, T.C. Williams High School, uh, some relatives, in fact, uh, one in particular of my executive producer, Joe Zephyrin, uh, his aunt Vilma. Uh, Vilma Zephyrin, we thank you. Uh, and her crew, Laura Strom, Afton Adam, and Christopher Gerlach. Uh, let me ask you to thank all of those persons, every one of them, every one of them, every one of them, every one of them for making this possible. And let me ask you while you're clapping to thank all of our guests, including Ralph Nader and others who've been here today to be a part of this. And let me ask you to give yourself some love for coming out today to push poverty higher up on the American agenda. We thank you for coming out. This is the Poverty Tour 2.0 brought to you by Pacifica and Native One America.